A very good morning to you. It is seven o'clock on today's show. Has the UK fallen into recession? We're about to find out. Plus, a man suspected of abducting Madeleine McCann to go on trial in Germany in a separate sex crime case. And the academics suggesting exercise as a core treatment for depression, saying it could be better than medication. It is Thursday, the 15th of February. A Jewish charity records more than 4,000 anti-Semitic incidents in 2023, an unprecedented number it describes as an explosion in hatred. We're in Kansas City, Missouri, and there is gunshots. One person killed, 21 injured, including children, after a Super Bowl celebration becomes the latest backdrop for an American mass shooting. No comment from the Foreign Office after US Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene's undiplomatic response to the Foreign Secretary's intervention on Ukraine aid. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. Sky News goes inside a mental health bank, which is helping children who don't have time to wait for NHS treatment. Two, one, ignition. And liftoff. Go SpaceX, go ISO. Uh, SpaceX's Falcon rocket uh, blasts off on a mission that no private business has managed so far a successful lunar landing. A very good morning to you. We start with the breaking news on the economy and whether or not the UK has gone into a recession. Uh, we've just got the data for Q4. Gurpreet Narwan is here with us, uh, the data crossing moments ago. Gurpreet, what is it? So Q4 minus 0.3%, worse than expectations. It means that the UK economy did enter recession towards the end of last year. But just double checking that there weren't any revisions to the Q3 data. Uh, that's when uh, the economy shrank by 0.1%. Well, what does that mean? It means that we've met the technical definition of a recession. It means we've had two quarters in which the economy contracted. But I guess we talk about the technical definition of a recession. How does that radically change things for us? Well, it doesn't. It's important to point out that numbers like these, they're often at the margins and there can be revisions. There have been revisions. You may remember the 2011 double dip revision, that, uh, uh, recession that was wiped out of the history books. I think instead of getting distracted by whether we're in a recession or not, I think there's no doubt that the economy has been stagnating over mm -hmm. the past two years since the Bank of England has been ratcheting up interest rates to cope with uh, inflation to help bring it down. We've been reporting quarterly GDP figures like minus 0.1%, 0%, 0.1%. .1%. These aren't inspiring figures. Just had news in that the, the Q3 data wasn't revised, so we are officially in recession. And we've seen the effects of all of this, falling living standards, rising mortgage costs, mm -hmm. rising rents, people dipping into their savings. In many ways, it's not telling us more than what we already know. But nevertheless, it's deeply embarrassing for Rishi Sunak. Remember, he came in, his role was to steady the ship, to sort out the mess of his predecessor. His big sell was that he was going to sort out inflation and get the economy growing by the end of the year. I mean, I think the, the key point, uh, as you said, is it's not a steep recession uh, yet and obviously we hope it's uh, short and sharp but it is a recession as, as obviously you're saying two quarters in a row of uh, negative growth I always think it's funny when people then say oh well, that's the technical definition what's well, the definition we all go by always so, so it's been met the, the interesting thing Gurpreet on, on this data is that actually the, the quarter we've just had is worse than expected yeah. uh, you know yes we're still talking about margins here but negative 0.3 percent growth starts mm. to, to put you into the realm of uh, of, you know, disappointing for just a, a three-month period when the expectation was for negative 0.1%. And I guess the key from here will be if things uptick and uptick quite quickly in, in the months that, that of course, have, have followed at the start of this year. Yeah, I think if there's some good news in this is that this recession, it's um, probably going to be a shallow one. Most economists are expecting it to be a shallow one. The general trend is that inflation has been coming down. We can expect the Bank of England in the next few months to start uh, cutting interest rates. That's all going to leave people with more money in their pockets, more mm -hmm. money to spend in the economy. So uh, hopefully uh, we've turned a corner already, but figures like these it points to two years of stagnation, still questions for the Chancellor ahead of the budget about how he's really going to turbocharge growth 
in the UK economy. I mean, I, I do think the, the slight odd thing that comes from this is whether the worst data in the short term then leads policymakers to ease uh, their policy a little bit more going forward. And I think uh, you look at all the data um, of late, with particularly that inflation data early in the week where inflation was a little bit lower than expected. It, it, you can probably say with some confidence at this point that we're not going to see further interest rate hikes, mm. which is a factor itself in slowing down the economy. Uh, and we're probably, given all the rhetoric that Mari can weigh in as well from uh, the government, we're probably not going to see further tax hikes either. And in that sense, the short-term cyclical restrictions on the economy from policy, fiscal policy from the government, monetary policy from the Bank of England, we've probably passed the peak tight policy thus far. Yeah, I think we'll see what um, financial markets are saying about uh, where interest rates are going to go. But I imagine that uh, the bets are that we're going to get uh, faster and more uh, interest rate cuts uh, in the coming months. There have already been, there's already been debate about whether the bank has been slow to cut interest rates. We heard Andy Haldane speaking to Sophie Ridge saying that the bank should already have started cutting interest rates. So I think, I think what, one thing that this does do is raise expectations that the Bank of England will very soon start cutting mm. interest rates. Mari, the, the other political question is, uh, is whether it influences the date of the election at all. Yeah. Um, it, it, it certainly creates some negative headlines uh, for the government, a negative reality as well. Uh, it's not a headline from, from nowhere. Does it therefore at the margin just increase the chances that the government want to wait for a bit longer to see if the tax cuts announced in October, potentially more tax cuts coming in March, potentially an interest rate cut from the Bank of England can take effect and just make people feel a little bit better? I think that would be a very fair assumption. I think you're right. First of all, the government don't really feel that they got much credit for the tax cuts that we saw coming in in the beginning of January as it is. They want to get as much credit as possible for people feeling richer. And I think at the moment, going for a spring election, it's always possible, but I think going for a spring election could be slightly dangerous when, as you say, will people feel it yet? So I think interest rate cuts coming in will help mortgage uh, and homeowners. I think then uh, more tax cuts that we are expecting in the March budget, again, will make people feel maybe slightly, I wouldn't even say richer, but really just slightly less poor than people mm -hmm. feel at the moment and therefore I think a lot of people feel like it's the safe decision to go for that autumn election but we still you know yeah. anything can happen well of course the problem for the government as well on this uh, is that any of these changes in policy take months mm. to filter through yeah. uh, not weeks and uh, realistically you're not going to get much uh, bang for your buck uh, before an election is due anyway in January but we shall see we're going to discuss much more uh, about that data with Simon French from Pamela Gordon that uh, will be uh, shortly he's just diving through all of the minor lines uh, in the data release and we'll have uh, him join us in a little while. Now, a Jewish charity which monitors anti-Semitism across the UK says there's been an explosion in hatred with the number of incidents surging last year. Let's bring in uh, Mari to talk more uh, about this. Uh, I don't need to bring you in. You're, you're, we're, we're discussing this. Maybe <laughs> I wasn't meant me, to bring you in on the last discussion, but I did. Um, anyway, um, Mari, what exactly... So, so first, just tell us who this charity is and, and this report is, has been scheduled. They've been looking at it quite... Uh, quite uh, carefully and, uh, and, and what the key takeaways are. Yes, so CST is the Community Security Trust. They are a charity that monitor anti-Semitic abuse, attacks and all those kinds of things. And also they try and ensure security for the Jewish community here in the UK. They've been measuring this data since the 80s. So it's not like it's very kind of fresh data. They've been comparing this data for decades. And what they found is the Community uh, Security Trust has found that it essentially, there's been more than four thousand anti-Jewish hate incidents last year. That's the highest and that annual total for the charity has ever recorded since they started in the 80s. Of the incidents reported by this charity, they say most of them, so 66% of them, occurred on or after the October the 7th attack in Israel. And also, last year's incidents, they tally represent essentially a 147% increase on the number that we had of anti-Semitic attacks and incidents since 2022. So it is massively increased and the uptick is very much in part because of what has been happening since October the 7th. Now, what's really also interesting is if you look into the report, they talk about a many things, but one of the things they talk about is the fact that actually it's growing in schools. So they talk about how uh, about 18% of these incidents involve people who are under 18 and they're concerned that youngsters are actually perpetrating a lot of the anti-Semitism. They also talk about how uh, many, many times during these incidents, 
What has been referenced as part of these incidents is Israel, Palestine or the Hamas terror attack on the October 7th. So we know realistically from this data is very heavily suggesting that the October 7th attack and the fallout in the UK, on the UK streets, has really impacted on the experience of Jewish people in the UK. And as I was saying to Gareth earlier, I mean, for some people they will find this very shocking. A lot of people will find this actually really depressingly not surprising, especially Jewish people who've been you know, suffering the abuse themselves. And I think it really just demonstrates and really brings home how much international conflicts can spill over into UK life mm -hmm. and UK politics. I mean, that's all we've been talking about. Yeah, uh, I should also point out as well, we're looking at the latest police data, which is not as up to date as today's report. And of course, there's been an increase in uh, Islamophobic hate as well, albeit uh, based on the numbers today in this uh, report uh, to, to a lesser extent. But we're going to discuss all of this, Mari, a little bit later with uh, one of the authors of the report, Dr. Dave Rich from the Community Trust, uh, Community Security Trust, uh, the Jewish charity behind that report Mari was just talking about. That's about 7.45 uh, a.m. Uh, what about uh, the other headlines today, We're going to start with Kansas, because in the United States, at least one person has been killed and 21 others injured, including children, in a mass shooting at a Super Bowl parade. Fans of the Kansas City Chiefs had been celebrating the team's victory when shots sent panic through the crowds. Three people have been arrested, but police are yet to determine a motive. Our US correspondent, Martha Kellner, has the details. See them pumping up the crowd there on the top of the bus. There's confetti! It was supposed to be a day of celebration. More than a million people cramming the streets of Kansas City to welcome home their Super Bowl winning team. One of its stars, Travis Kelsey, boyfriend of Taylor Swift, throwing a ball to fans. But then the party is pierced by gunshots. A mass of red shirts run in the direction of the city's Union Station. With so many people in such a small space, it's difficult to tell where the bullets are being fired from. We're in Kansas City, Missouri, and there is gunshots. One woman hiding under a car phones the police. Who's the other guy that helped me? Another parade goer tackles one of the presumed shooters. A Kansas City radio station says one of its DJs, Lisa Lopez, died in the shooting. The city's mayor was forced to run to safety too. I was there with my wife, I was there with my mother. Uh, we never would have thought that we, along with Chiefs players, along with fans, hundreds of thousands of people, would be forced to run for our safety today. There were 800 police patrolling the parade, but they couldn't prevent the bloodshed. Three people have now been arrested and investigators say the motive for the shooting isn't clear. It's not thought, though, to be terror-related. In a statement, Travis Kelsey said, I'm heartbroken over the tragedy that took place today. My heart is with all who came out to celebrate with us and have been affected. KC, you mean the world to me. This level of gun violence is all too common. This, the 48th mass shooting just this year. At an event to mark the country's biggest sporting victory, it is a uniquely American tragedy. Martha Kellner, Sky News. Lebanese security sources say six children are among 11 people killed by Israeli strikes in villages along the country's southern border yesterday. The strikes were Israel's response to a Hezbollah rocket attack that killed one of its soldiers. There's been no comment from the Foreign Office after a US Congresswoman's extraordinary remarks directed at the Foreign Secretary. The Republican right-winger Marjorie Taylor Greene was asked by Sky News about Lord Cameron drawing comparisons to the appeasement of Adolf Hitler as he urged Congress to pass a Ukraine aid package. Well, he likened you to an appeaser to Hitler in not voting through funding for Ukraine. Are you an appeaser for Putin? I, I think that... Um... I really don't care what David Cameron has to say. I think that's rude name-calling, um, and I don't appreciate that type of language. And David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. Uh, extraordinary remarks there, as, uh, as Gareth says. Uh, we're going to talk more about that later in, in the show. And, uh, of course, a huge vote, uh, or if the vote gets to the floor, potential vote 
in the US as it relates to Ukraine funding. But we're going to return now to our top story, uh, the breaking news that the UK, UK economy has fallen into recession. Uh, joining me now here is Simon French, uh, Chief Economist at Investment Bank, Pamela Gordon. Let's talk first of all, Simon, about the data we just got, which was mm. just for Q4, the October yep. to December period. It was worse than expected and a decline of 0.3%. It was. Uh, market consensus was for a smaller decline, 0.1%. I think what strikes you immediately from the data is actually construction, services and production, the three major component parts of the UK economy, all contracted. That's broader base than we'd expected. Wow. What was driving this? Well, there was certainly some caution amongst household spending at, uh, during Christmas time. The challenge was we had a bit of a leading indicator of this in retail sales over the December period, which we already knew were very, very soft. What we didn't really know is whether there'd been spending elsewhere and hospitality and leisure that compensated for that. It looked like where there was in pockets, it wasn't broad-based enough to keep the economy out of recession. Now, uh, we've been saying uh, that means now we're in recession because of two quarters in a row of mm. uh, of negative growth and uh, that's confirmed because Q3 was a smaller decline. That's right, 0.1% decline in Q3. Now it's worth saying at this point that economic data is, is often revised um, and such are these small margins that I there's a risk of overinterpretation of small margins here overall taken in its um, longer term view the whole of 2023, the economy has only seemed to have grown by 0.1%. That's pretty much a flat line, suggesting the economy is going nowhere. That doesn't make the UK a massive outlier versus the likes of the European economies, the likes of Japan. The real outlier in the global economy, honestly, is the United States, which is on a very, very different growth path. But every other economy that imports large parts of energy is dealing with the shock that its household sector and its business sector is still struggling to deal with. So, I mean, that, that's an interesting point just to, to focus on. Clearly, our performance, whether we look at 2023 as a whole or headlines like recession or not, mm. has been worse than the US by quite some distance. Yes. It, it's probably fair to say it's been better than some of the European economies, like Germany, which was already in a recession, and a recession that's a bit more pronounced than ours. Which of those two is, is more of a surprise, uh, that we're underperforming the US or that we're outperforming Germany? Um, I'd say that we're outperforming Germany. The commentary suggests the UK is something of a sort of sick man of Europe. I don't think that's right. I think UK economic performance in recent times has tracked the European area. The biggest strategic challenge for European economies, it doesn't matter whether we're talking about Germany, France, Italy or the UK, is that we're a big importer of energy needs. And therefore, when you have the kind of extraordinary energy spikes that we've had in the last 18 months, an economy like the US and also Canada that are either um, they export as much as they import in terms of energy, or in the case of Canada, actually export much more than they, they import, they do better. So I'd say the fact that there's been a slight high performance versus Germany is probably the more surprising data point. Um, now, if we step back and say that ultimately over the course of 2023, the economy is basically flatlining, mm. a lot of people would say that that's uh, flatlining at a sort of uneven rate. And, and thus, there are pockets of society that will be feeling a much more negative experience than that, uh, and that is not particularly exciting in the first place. Absolutely. Um, if you were to look, we got data yesterday on UK inflation. Now, although in the consumer prices, mortgage interest costs aren't included, within the retail prices, mortgage interest costs are um, included. And that went up 45% over the last 12 months. So if large parts of your budget are allocated to mortgage payments, you're going, hang on, Inflation at 4% and, you know, not a deep recession. It's feeling very much like a recession for households who are heavily exposed to that. Whereas if you own your property outright and you don't consume large parts of your budget, for example, on food and energy, you may go, well, actually, with unemployment at 3.8%, which is near its historic lows, you're going, actually, it doesn't feel like a recession at all. A very, very bifurcated picture. Um, in terms of... Uh... The other data that we look at, um, employment data and unemployment, we got that earlier in the week. Mm -hmm. I mean, does that actually suggest that things are going OK, at least within the jobs market? It's funny, in the US, you talk about the jobs data much more, perhaps, than the GDP data. It's the other way around here. Well, what's your take on that data we got earlier in the week? Well, I'm pleased you referenced the United States because it's come up a couple of times in this conversation. The way they define a recession is different to ours. We tend to use this, it's not a definition, a convention of two successive courses of negative growth. They take a more holistic view and they bring in the jobs data. And I have to say, a recession with 
sub 4% unemployment uh, doesn't look like any other recession I've uh, seen or sort of modelled in, in my career as an economist. And I do think that when you're interpreting the health of the UK economy, any economy, uh, a broad basket of indicators is really helpful, not least the fact that when you're measuring something like GDP, given all the flux we've had in the economy, how we've consumed, how we've behaved since the pandemic, it's a very, very difficult thing to, to provide precise estimates to, to one decimal place like we've seen this And morning. that unemployment data we got earlier in the week was 3.8%. Just finally, yeah. Simon, w w would it be fair to say, despite the fact the government wanted to avoid this headline uh, that the economy's in recession and it's failed to, to do so, that it's likely the worst is behind us on the economy? And, and link that for me, uh, if you will, to, to the likely policy changes from here in terms of are we going to get tighter fiscal or monetary policy? Or is that about to start to ease off a little bit? Well, so three parts to that answer. One, for households and for businesses, they'll see their energy costs come down quite appreciably in April and probably again in July through the energy price cap. That puts more disposable income back in their pockets. So the, the view for household budgets is that should improve through the year. Then secondly, you mentioned what we might expect from fiscal policy, the budget on the 6th of March. We're seeing signs from the Treasury uh, that they are considering further tax cuts. So you don't want to go too much into their policy. I should have asked you specifically no, of course. That. And then finally, on monetary policy, interest rates. Uh, while I don't think, I think the market over anticipated how many interest rate cuts we might get, I still think we will see some, possibly one or two interest rate cuts in the second half of the year as inflation comes down. Simon uh, French uh, from Pamela Gordon, thanks so much for joining us. Much appreciated. Now, suspecting the disappearance of Madeleine McCann is due to appear in a German court tomorrow to face trial over allegations of rape and sexual abuse of children. They relate to separate incidents, which are said to have taken place in Portugal between 2000 and 2017. 45-year-old Christian B, who we cannot fully name or show due to German privacy laws, hasn't been charged in the McCann case and has denied any involvement. Well, let's go live to our crime correspondent, Martin Brunt. Uh, Martin... Just remind us what we know about this individual and, and what is he actually facing trial for specifically uh, today? Well, the world knows Christian B as the suspect in the Madeleine McCann case, but since four years ago, he was identified as that suspect. He's been effectively uh, demonised. But uh, the trial tomorrow, begins tomorrow, um, is about sex crimes completely unconnected to the Madeleine case. But I've been talking to a former lawyer of Christian B in Portugal who wonders, can he really get a fair trial that starts tomorrow? Here's my report. According to the prosecutor, the suspect's sex crimes stretch 30 miles along Portugal's Algarve coast and over two decades. German drifter Christian B, whose full identity is protected by privacy laws, denies all charges, among them on Salima Beach, a sex attack on a girl of 10. In his rented home, the rape of a teenage girl. Lawyer Seraphim Vieira once defended Christian B for stealing diesel. The year was 2006. Uh, the man that I knew then uh, is not the man that I got, uh, I found out to be or that is supposed to be. He seemed like uh, just a normal guy that uh, was traveling around Europe, uh, having a good time, eventually doing things that probably were not quite right, as many do. Since then, Christian B has become notorious. As well as the trial he faces this week, he's also the suspect in the disappearance of British girl Madeleine McCann. She vanished 17 years ago from the family's rented holiday apartment. He hasn't been charged over Madeleine and denies any involvement. What do you think the world thinks of Christian B? The worst, especially after the, the, the firm accusations of the German prosecutor that he did commit a crime about uh, related uh, Maddie McCann. Can he get a fair trial? I don't think so. Uh, I hope so, but uh, it's very, I think it's very difficult. In the resort of Prada, Russia, Christian B is accused of raping a young woman. He's said to have tied up an Irish holiday worker and subjected her to a prolonged ordeal. The alleged victim, Hazel Behan, 
thought after so long her case from 2004 would never be solved. She said in this statement that the Portuguese police didn't properly investigate her rape. I was told to go home by the police, she said. I was told it would ruin the holiday trade. She said she left the police station expecting an investigation, but heard nothing more. In a village in the hills above the coast, Christian B is accused of flashing at a young girl. Her mother has previously described what happened. His arrest there led to extradition to Germany and this week's trial, which is expected to last until the summer. The trial will be heard not by a jury, but by a panel of judges, and they're considered to be immune from prejudice and any influence. Um, the first day tomorrow, um, but the trial is being staggered over many particular days and uh, is expected to last until June. Martin, uh, great stuff. It'll be absolutely fascinating to, to follow that and uh, great that we'll have you doing that for us. Martin Brunt there for us. Let's have a quick look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. It'll be mostly uh, very mild into the weekend, but rather unsettled. It's generally mild, but quite murky now, with hill fog and drizzly outbreaks for many, and heavier, more general rain over northern Britain and around the Irish Sea. Wales and western England will see rain taking over this morning, heavy in the southwest, but eastern England looks mainly dry with sunny spells developing. Scotland will have further rain, while Ireland and Northern Ireland will see patchy rain giving way to sunny spells and a few showers. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. So to come here on The Breakfast Show, how a possible fault in fertility treatment at two clinics may have impaired the chances of hundreds of couples to have children. We'll speak to the solicitor representing affected patients. Plus, how a self-funded community mental health service is providing much-needed support to Britain's youth. And what do these mean to you? Apparently, uh, how we interpret emojis changes based on gender and age. I love that story too. We'll be right back. Thank you. How on earth did you guys get all of us women in one room together. 40 people together to shoot the cover of Vogue. Edward. It's an insane concept. My reaction whenever Edward asks anything is always, you know, yes, let's see, and let's see what's possible. I didn't actually think it would really uh, come together in the way that I did, if I'm really honest, but I said, great, that's a fantastic idea. Let's see what we can do. It was a lot like a military operation. Um, we had an amazing team working on it. You know, it wasn't just me. I had amazing colleagues also working on it. Um, and Edward went out basically to all of these amazing women who had previously been on his covers during his tenure. And he wrote to them all personally, um, you know, to ask them if they would take part. And, you know, then the, the sort of the yeses started coming in and we just, um, just started building it from there, you know, starting with one day and then, um, just saying to everyone, this is the date, you've got to be there. It was really was amazing. And Edward kept adding people as, you know, as people said, yes, he wanted it to be this amazing, really um, diverse, incredible group. I think we started off thinking maybe it would be sort of 20. And, you know, I'd wake up the next morning and he would be like, oh, you know, Oprah said yes, or, you know, Miley said yes, or Naomi said yes, and then suddenly it would be 30, and then it was 35, and then everyone was like, wouldn't it be nice if it was 40? Um, so, yeah, that's how it kind of grew incrementally. It was amazing. It really was, like, such an incredible day. It was, you know, it was really emotional for, like, for a lot of us who worked with Edward, you know, um, who've been with him right from the beginning, so it really kind of felt kind of coming full circle in that way. It was just everyone was everyone was there for Edward. And so it really felt like such a special, special moment. And everyone was really there for him rather than being there, you know, for themselves or to promote something. So it really felt, you know, just incredible. I think it just it sort of says everything. Um, 
that all of those people would come and, and be there for him um, to celebrate what he did at, at British Vogue during his time. I think that's, you know, that picture just like really says it all because everyone just came together to give their time so freely and, you know, just, just, just to make an amazing, amazing image. Welcome back to The Breakfast Show. Well, coming up, the scandal hitting two UK fertility clinics. We'll speak to a solicitor representing hopeful parents. Plus, with recorded cases of anti-Semitism at an all-time high, we'll hear from the charity, which claims there's been an explosion of hatred against the Jewish community since the Hamas attacks. But, first of all, let's uh, go back into the breaking news this morning. The UK economy has gone into recession. A reminder that uh, the data that we got this morning was for Q4, the fourth quarter last year. Uh, a contraction of 0.3%, and the forecasts have been a contraction of 0.1%, so a bit worse than expected. Follows a small contraction in the third quarter of 0.1%, two quarters in a row, uh, meets the definition of a recession. And guys, we've just had some comments come through as well uh, from the Chancellor. Uh, he's saying, high inflation is the single biggest barrier to growth, which is why halving it's been our priority. Uh, he says, low growth is no surprise given the higher interest rates. Uh, and he says, why there are signs that the British economy is turning a cor corner, forecasters agree that growth will strengthen over the next few years. He says, although times are still tough, we must stick to the plan, cutting taxes on work uh, and business to build a stronger economy. I want to get to Lib Dem's comments on this in a moment. But Mahari, unsurprisingly there, uh, the Chancellor is trying to look forward and uh, to some extent make excuses, pointing to the fact that interest rates are high uh, so low growth is not a surprise and not wanting to look backwards yes. at the fact that the definition has been met that the economy has fallen into a recession. Absolutely. I think it's really interesting that we know the realistically Jeremy Hunt and the government will have been preparing for this. We know that the expectation was already recession. The fact that it's slightly worse than expected, I think they will have had some contingency planning for this because we knew this was coming. The difficulty is how you try and find a way to still sell that narrative that you are fiscally credible when we are officially in recession. And I think the difficulty is yesterday we had the inflation figures and they were slightly better than expected. Still not great because it didn't actually change. It stayed the same. And let's not forget, inflation staying flat doesn't mean prices aren't going up. They're still going up. They're just not going up at a faster rate. So people need to remember that. But also now we're in a recession. How do you spin that? How do you sell that? in an election year. That is really, really difficult for the Treasury for number 10. Mm -hmm. And realistically, that is the best Jeremy Hunt is going to be able to do. There's always a mosaic of factors that come into play here. I was just, you know, the comments that our colleagues on, on the website are making as well. Things like rainfall, mm -hmm. higher in the final months of 2023. Wind speeds increased as well, which meant that parts of the economy like construction and retail affected. And you think those kind of issues will only get worse with climate change, but also points to the fragility of the economy that three months of wet weather yeah. can have the impact that it does. Yeah, I mean, listen, there's always little factors, aren't there, that affect the data. I think the standout thing is that December was the worst month of that quarter. Uh, and it's always a bit more bumpy. It can sometimes massively boost uh, your Q4 performance if, if it's a strong holiday period. Uh, and uh, as Simon French was mentioning, we kind of knew that from the retail sales data that the, re the various retailers had reported. It just came out to be a bit worse and broader than expected. Um, you know, we'll see what happens in, in January, February and whether we get a third quarter coming up. Just quickly want to mention as well, Mari, uh, you mentioned how people will want to spin this. The Lib Dem leader, uh, Ed Davey, has said, Rishi's recession has savaged the British economy by decimating growth and leaving families to cope with spiralling uh, prices. And uh, goes on to say, years of conservative chaos and a revolving door of conservative chances has culminated in economic uh, turmoil. I mean, interesting. I, I think it's... For, for the 2023 as a whole, uh, a growth, small growth of 0.13%. I don't think it's uh, quite uh, fair to say decimated uh, growth, but Rishi's recession. I think Rishi's recession is catchy. 
And I think realistically, we're going to see this again and again and again. It's an easy headline. It's an easy phrase that you can continue to repeat to try and essentially drum in to the population. And I think we have a narrative, whether it's accurate or not, we have a narrative from opposition that is very easy to tell when it comes to Liz Truss, mini budget, crashing the economy, as many like to say, and then Rishi coming in and supposedly steadying the ship, but the ship doesn't look so steady. And I think this is going to be a real concern for the Conservatives around whether they can still find a way to claw back economic credibility mm -hmm. in time. Uh, all of this, of course, relating to the news that crossed uh, the top of the hour, that the UK economy fell by 0.3% uh, for the fourth quarter last year. It follows a decline of 0.1% in the third quarter uh, and therefore two consecutive quarters in a row uh, of negative growth, putting the UK economy into a recession. Now, couples hoping to have a child through IVF may have had their chances hindered due to faulty fertility treatment. The fertility regulator says the issues arose at Guy's Hospital in central London and Jessup Fertility uh, Centre in Sheffield. It's believed a faulty liquid may have been used to freeze eggs and embryos. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let's speak to Catherine Slattery, a solicitor who is representing individuals who've been impacted by this. Th this is... Uh, an absolutely shocking story and uh, this sounds so tragic for many of the parents involved. What do we know exactly has happened thus far? Is it guaranteed that these embryos are, are spoilt or not? We understand from the people that we've spoken to that the embryos are non-viable or the eggs that have been collected are non-viable, which is deeply, deeply upsetting for the individuals involved. Well, I was going to ask next, I mean, how have some of the clients that you're now representing react to this? They, they must be devastated. They are. They're absolutely devastated. Um, I've had a number of very upsetting phone calls um, with individuals that have been affected, um, you know, and they've come to have fertility treatment for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, and fertility treatment in of itself is very distressing. It's in a very emotionally trying time. But to have something like this happen that is completely beyond their control is quite difficult to cope with. Um, and, and just remind us again what, what we know happened. This is based on a, a liquid that's used? That's what we understand, yes, that the culture medium that was used to store the eggs or embryos, depending on the, the couple and the, the individuals involved, um, was faulty. And essentially, when they've gone to thaw the eggs or embryos for implantation, it's not um, been successful. And, and obviously, you are uh, looking to and are representing some of uh, the people that have uh, suffered from this and, and to, to look at various next steps and legal action. Who, who might that be against? Who's at fault for this? Is it the, the person, the company that manufactured the, the liquid? Is it the uh, NHS as a whole? Is it the individual hospitals? Investigations are at a very early stage, so at the moment it's difficult to say who we might pursue a claim against. It seems more than likely that on the initial information that we have, that the preliminary claim was probably against the manufacturer of the um, product itself, the culture medium, if that is the problem. Um, there may also be a claim in medical negligence against the NHS or the private sector um, whoever's supplied the fertility treatment, because I think my understanding is, is that some of the patients are NHS patients and some are private sector patients as well. Well, Catherine, uh, thanks so much for joining us on this and do please come back uh, when we do know more information on it. Thank you. Catherine uh, Slattery there from Irwin Mitchell Solicitors. Now, Holiday Park has been found to have racially discriminated against Irish travellers by instructing staff uh, to cancel or decline bookings of individuals with traditional Irish names or Irish accents. Let's bring in our correspondent, Alice Porter. What, what exactly has gone on here, Alison, and what has that put the, the, the park in breach of? Well, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, they did an investigation into Pontons, which is the, the holiday park involved. And this was after a whistleblower came forward in 2020 and said that gypsies and travellers were being discriminated against, and in particular, Irish travellers. So they did an investigation and we've got those findings today. So firstly, they found that staff were instructed to decline or cancel bookings made under certain Irish names labelled undesirable. We understand the whistleblowers sent a list of 40 surnames that were put on that list. 
Then call centre staff were told to listen out for Irish accents and decline or cancel their bookings. Guests identified as Irish travellers were put on no longer welcome database to ensure future bookings would be denied. And rules were introduced to require guests to appear on the electoral register, a practice found to be discriminatory against travellers who are less likely to be registered. And so the Equality and Human Rights Commission concluded that Pontins broke the law on several occasions. And what, what do we think the next steps are? Well, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, they've ordered Pontins to apologise to the Irish traveller community. They've also ordered them to do an action plan based on their recommendations. If they don't do that, then they could face criminal charges. Now, a spokesperson for Britannia Jinky Jersey Limited, which owns Pontins, they've given us this statement. They say, the call centre where the incidents took place has closed and the majority of the staff involved have now left Pontins. We apologise to all who may have been affected. Pontins is committed to ensuring ongoing compliance with the Equality Act 2010. Alice, great stuff. Thanks so much. Sky News has been told that underinvestment in children's mental health services is resulting in immediate suffering for thousands of youngsters in the UK. In a bid to curb the backlog and get patients seen, the NHS is now referring individuals to community-run clinics. Our People and Politics correspondent Nick Martin has been to one of those centres which funds its own counsellors. A warning, this report has references to suicide and self-harm. Sebastian is 11 years old and nothing makes him happier than being out on a court because bullying in school led him into a dark place. People were really badly kicking me. They were making me bleed and it hurt a lot and it was happening for a long time. So I got a sudden idea that I wanted to, to cut myself because I didn't want to exist. I thought that maybe without me, the school will be better and everyone will forget about me. Sebastian's story takes us to the heart of a mental health crisis affecting hundreds of thousands of children. I feel very bad because uh, the most important thing ever in my life is to get my to see my child happy. Sebastian's GP didn't refer him to the NHS's Children and Adolescent Mental Health Service, CAMS for short. He was referred here, a community centre. We have parents coming in here who don't know where to go. They're crying out for help. What does it say about the system that referrals are now coming to you, a charity effectively? It says that there's a, it's broken. The system is broken. Just under half a million children and young people in England are currently on mental health waiting lists, 85% higher than before the pandemic. It's very normal that we have food banks because people can't afford to eat. There's a, you know, there's a cost of living crisis. Go to a food bank, it's becoming the same for mental health. So there's a food bank down the road dishing out beans and pasta. Mm -hmm. This is like a mental health bank dishing mm -hmm. out support and counselling. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. But the Jade Centre receives no funding from the NHS, despite the NHS sending patients here. The NHS says they're treating record numbers of young people for their mental health, and the Department for Health and Social Care told us they're investing an additional £2.3 billion a year into mental health services. Sebastian looks much more happy now, more calm. This is about as far from a clinical setting as you can get. Yet the NHS and others are now relying on places like these to help desperate children and their declining mental health before it's too late. Nick Martin, Sky News, Rotherham. Well, if you or someone you know have been affected by the issues raised in Nick's report, you can contact the Samaritans helpline on 116123 or email joe at samaritans.org. Now, uh, a SpaceX rocket has successfully launched from NASA's Cape Canaveral base in Florida. Three, two, one, ignition, and liftoff. Go SpaceX, go IM-1 and the Odysseus lunar lander. 
It's carrying a private lunar spacecraft, which is aiming to land on the south pole of the moon in about nine days' time. Uh, let's now bring in our science uh, correspondent, Thomas Moore. So, Thomas, just remind us, this was meant to take off uh, a couple of days earlier? Yeah, it was supposed to take off yesterday, uh, but they had problems when they were fueling up the uh, spacecraft inside the rocket, uh, so they, they delayed it to this morning. But it was it went perfectly. Uh, the, the SpaceX Falcon 9 rising into the Florida sky uh, with the, the Odysseus spacecraft uh, right at the top, and it's on its way now, its epic journey to the South Pole of the moon. Now, it's going to be significant for two reasons. It is, if it does make it down onto the surface, uh, it will be the first time that the United States has been there since 1972 with the Apollo landings. Uh, but also, perhaps more significantly, uh, is the fact that it is, is uh, the first of several missions to the South Pole of the Moon this year. They're going to be looking for water. Now, why water when we have so much of it on Earth? Because it can sustain um, astronauts on the lunar surface surface for prolonged missions, not just to hydrate them, but also if you split the H2O molecule, you get oxygen to breathe and hydrogen for rocket fuel. So really significant if they do find water ice in this perilously cold region of the moon. I have six questions on my <laughs> notes here, uh, but I'm told I can't do them this hour for various reasons, uh, but we will have a longer chat uh, next hour. Uh, and uh, really geek out on this. Uh, I look forward to it then, and thank you for that, Thomas. Right, still to come here on The Breakfast Show, we will speak uh, to the Jewish charity that says it's tracked an explosion in hatred towards the Jewish community. That's next.
Welcome back. Uh, reported cases of anti-Semitism in the UK have hit new highs, with the blame being placed on the October the 7th Hamas attacks on Israel. On the show yesterday, Lord Mann, who is an independent advisor to the UK government on anti-Semitism, warned Kay that the report would be damning. We're going to see more and more of this. The, the growth of extremism and the growth of anti-Semitism, um, and the f official figures come out tomorrow, um, and uh, let's see what they bring, but it's not going to be good news. Well, joining me now is Dr Dave Rich. He's Director of Policy at the Community Security Trust, a charity that carried out the research. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining me, Dave. So just uh, uh, tell our viewers, you, this is a report you carry out annually, uh, and, and what have you found uh, this time around? Good morning. This is a report based on reports to our charity, Community Security Trust, from Jewish people across the country who have been racially abused, harassed, attacked, and they're reporting this to us. We always encourage them to report to the police as well, and we publish figures twice a year. What we found is that last year was the highest total on record, over 4,100 anti-Jewish hate incidents across the country, which is by far the highest annual total we've ever had. The previous record was around 2,260. Now, we knew on the morning of 7th of October, when news broke of the Hamas terror attack on Israel, that we would see a big surge in anti-Jewish hatred in this country, because we see it every time Israel is at war. And that in itself is bad enough that it can be so predictable and it always happens and we should never accept that as normal. But the scale of it this time has been really shocking. The numbers have been much worse, much higher than we've ever seen previously. And so these are annual figures, but were the numbers uh, all skewed to post-October the 7th? Around two-thirds of the anti-Jewish hate incidents we recorded last year happened on or after October the 7th and the increase began immediately on that date. We recorded 31 anti-Semitic incidents that day, which was five or six times more than we had the day before. Broadly speaking, from 1st of January to 6th of October, we were recording five anti-Jewish hate incidents per day. From the 7th of October to the end of the year, it was over 30. So, so I'm interested in the timing of that because I, I guess I was thinking that some of these might have been triggered from Israel's response and we could have a separate debate about uh, the proportionality and, and, and stuff about that. But uh, you're su suggesting it's actually immediately the day of the attacks themselves as opposed to specifically Israel's response to the attacks. This is the really striking and I have to say appalling thing is that the anti-Semitism in this country began immediately on 7th of October and actually the week with the highest number of incidents was that week immediately following the Hamas attack. It didn't build gradually as the Israeli response uh, increased and the casualties in Gaza increased. The highest numbers, the highest daily totals were immediately following the Hamas terror attack. And what I think we have to conclude from that is that this is not some kind of rational, if misguided, response to people being angry or upset about scenes from Gaza. This is people who were happy at what they saw Hamas had done in Israel, the slaughter of 1,200 people, mass rape, kidnapping, and so on. And some very twisted people in this country went out to celebrate that by shouting abuse at Jewish people in the streets. Yeah, I, again, I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, picking holes in this. I guess you can't be sure of their motivations um, and, and say they were wanting uh, to celebrate that unless it was explicit. Um, also, not to try and pick holes in this either, but uh, do, do you track directly a rise in... This should be condemned un, un, unreservedly, obviously, a rise in this type of uh, anti-Semitic hate either way. But do, do you also track um, any rise in anti-Palestine or uh, Islamophobic hate as well, or, or at least accept or acknowledge there's probably been a rise in that too? Absolutely. We work very closely with a parallel organisation mm. called Tel Mama, which monitors anti-Muslim hatred in this country. And we've had literally weekly meetings with them and with the police since 7th of October to share statistics and share trends. And we've heard from them that there's been a rise in Islamophobic attacks in mm. this country as well. Um, talk to me about, um, and this might be a, an ignorant question, but the difference between uh, attacks on... Israel as the country uh, and Judaism and, and being Jewish as, as a religion. Do you think that the two are being merged a lot at the moment? Is that right or wrong? And what's your assessment of, of that nuance? So we're very careful to distinguish between anti-Semitic hatred and attacks on Jewish people 
and ordinary criticism of Israel or opposition to Israel. And around a third of the potential reports made to our organisation last year were not included in our statistics because they didn't meet our criteria as being anti-Semitic. And the broad difference, I would say, is if someone wants to walk down the street in central London waving a Palestinian flag or shouting free Palestine, that's completely fine. That's just normal politics and protest. If they go and do it outside a synagogue, deliberately targeting that building because it's a Jewish house of prayer, or if they go up to random Jewish people in the street and scream free Palestine in their face. You know, we had an incident a few weeks ago where a Jewish teenager on his way home from school was put up against a wall, punched in the face and told, say free Palestine. Now, that's anti-Semitic. That's not just normal politics. Of, of course. Um, what if people criticise Israel's response to the attacks? I mean, that's just the normal to and fro of politics, and everyone can have a different view on a conflict. But the fact is, this conflict is happening 2,000 miles away. British Jews are not responsible for it. We don't have any control over it. And we shouldn't be held to blame for what people think, think Israel is doing or see Israel is doing, and yet that is exactly what is happening. What would you like to see happen? Uh, is there an easy way that we can lessen this, this hatred that exists at the moment? You know, the first thing that should happen, and it seems simple and obvious, is that the people doing this should just stop. We often look to police, to government, to other people to find a solution, but the responsibility for this begins with the anti-Semites, with the people who are going out attacking, harassing and abusing Jewish people. The government and the police have been very supportive. We want to see more arrests and prosecutions, of course, but they've really tried to help and support the Jewish community. But this is a challenge for the whole of society, I think. I've only got 30 seconds left, but it doesn't look like there's an end in sight uh, to this conflict, uh, sadly. If there was, do you think it would get better? In the past, we've seen the amount of anti-Semitism has reduced after the conflict has ended, but it never goes back to normal. And it feels for British Jews like something changed on the 7th of October. Um, Dr Dave Rich, thank you very much for joining us. I mean, it's a really important uh, report. It's an annual report, uh, so there's clear data going back to compare things to. Uh, and we thank you for joining us this morning, Dr thank Dave you. Rich. After this short break, we'll have more on that breaking news from the top of the hour that the UK has fallen into recession. We'll be right back.
A very good morning to you. It is 8 o'clock and on today's show, the UK economy is officially in recession. What does it mean for your finances? Plus, a man suspected of abducting Madeleine McCann to go on trial in Germany in a separate sex crime case. And the academic suggesting exercise as a core treatment for depression, saying that it could be better than medication. It is Thursday the 15th of February and we are delighted to have you with us here on The Breakfast Show. The UK falls into recession as the economy shrinks more than expected. A Jewish charity records more than 4,000 anti-Semitic incidents in 2023, an unprecedented number it describes as an explosion in hatred. We're in Kansas City, Missouri, and there is good chance. One person killed, 21 injured, including children, after a Super Bowl celebration becomes the latest backdrop for an American mass shooting. No comment from the Foreign Office after US Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene's undiplomatic response to the Foreign Secretary's intervention on Ukraine aid. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. Moonshot, SpaceX's Two, Falcon rocket one, blasts off on a mission that no private business has managed so far, a successful lunar landing. And Odysseus lunar lander. A very good morning to you. The UK has officially entered a recession. It's uh, after GDP, gross domestic, gross domestic product, shrank at 0.3%. For the final quarter of last year, it followed a contraction of 0.1% in the three months from July to September. And we've just been hearing from the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. We always expected growth to be weaker while we prioritised tackling inflation. That means higher interest rates. And that's the right thing to do because you can't have long-term healthy growth with high inflation, but also for families uh, when the when there's a cost of living crisis, when the cost of their weekly shop is going up, their energy bills are much higher, it's the right thing to do. The underlying picture here is an economy that is more resilient than most people predicted. Inflation is coming down, real wages have been going up now for six months. And if we stick to our guns, independent forecasters say that by the early summer we could start to see interest rates falling and that will be a very important relief for families with mortgages. Let's bring in our political correspondent, Gurpreet Narwan. And uh, Gurpreet, unsurprisingly there, he kind of wanted to point the focus more to inflation, which has fallen from its peak, and point the focus forward, not just to the immediate months ahead, but to the summertime, uh, sort of suggesting there the time frame with which he expects uh, it to take to, to see more good news arrive on GDP data. Yeah, and... And unfortunately for him, there's no getting around the fact that these are disappointing figures. Minus 0.3%. That was worse than expectations. Economists were forecasting a contraction of 0.1% in the final quarter of the year. It followed a 0.1% contraction in the third quarter, meaning we've met the technical uh, definition of a recession. We were in recession during the second half of last year and the economy has suffered a broad-based decline. The services sector, construction sector, manufacturing sectors all contracted in the final quarter of the year. People weren't spending as much money in the run-up to Christmas. Poor weather probably had a role to play in that. Uh, and of course public sector strikes weighed heavily on the economy. I think the big question is does this lead to a radical reinterpretation of the last six months we've had. And I think there the answer is probably no. Since the Bank of England has been ratcheting up interest rates uh, to deal with inflation over the past two years, we've been reporting quarterly figures like minus 0.1%, 0.1%, 0.1%. Not very inspiring. And all of it uh, points to a prolonged period of stagnation in uh, the UK economy. And we've all uh, felt it, you know, uh, falling living standards, rising mortgages, mortgage costs, rising rents, people uh, dipping into their savings. But nevertheless, this is going to be embarrassing for the government because Rishi Sunak, you might remember, he his big sell was that he was here to sort out the economy, to sort out the mess of his predecessor, that him and Jeremy Hunt were going to steady the ship and promised that he would have the economy growing by the end of the year. That hasn't transpired. There are going to be questions of the Chancellor today, of course, and you can bet that Labour 
are going to use this opportunity uh, to stick the knife in as well. I think if there's any good news to all of this, it's probably that the worst of it is over. It, the recession is likely to have been a shallow one. And as uh, Jeremy Hunt said there, inflation broadly is coming down. The Bank of England is expected to start cutting interest rates. All of this will leave more money in people's pockets, boosting growth. So I think overall, not much worse than anything uh, we've grown accustomed to, but not much better either. Gerpreet, thanks uh, so much uh, for that. By the way, we just heard from the Chancellor. Uh, let's uh, bring in some of the comments we've had from elsewhere. Uh, here is a quote from Rachel Reeves. Uh, Rishi Sunak's promise to grow the economy is now in tatters. The Prime Minister can no longer credibly claim that his plan is working or that he's turned the corner on more than 14 years of economic decline under the Conservatives that has left Britain worse off. This is Rishi Sunak's recession and the news will be deeply worrying for families and businesses across Britain. It is time for a change. Uh, that's uh, Labour's Rachel Reeves. Meanwhile, uh, the Liberal Democrat leader, Ed Davey, uh, said this. Rishi's recession has savaged the British economy by decimating growth and leaving families to cope with spiralling prices. Years of Conservative chaos and a revolving door of Conservative chances has culminated in economic turmoil. It's hard-working Brits forced to pick up the tab for this mess through high food prices, tax hikes and skyrocketing mortgage bills. Well, reacting to the news, uh, the, the UK has uh, entered recession. Here is Simon French, uh, who was uh, joining us earlier to discuss um, uh, his take uh, on the economic data. He's uh, from Pamuel Gordon. There's a risk of overinterpretation of small margins here. Overall, taken in its um, longer term view, the whole of 2023, the economy is only seen to have grown by 0.1%. That's pretty much a flat line, suggesting the economy is going nowhere. That doesn't make the UK a massive outlier versus the likes of the European economies, the likes of Japan. The real outlier in the global economy, honestly, is the United States, which is on a very, very different growth path. But every other economy that imports large parts of energy is dealing with the shock that its household sector and its business sector is still struggling to deal with. Simon French uh, on the show earlier. Now, a Jewish charity uh, which monitors uh, anti-Semitism across the UK says there's been an explosion in hatred with the number of incidents surging in the last year. Let's bring in Mari Aurora uh, to talk more about this. Mari, just uh, remind us what this charity is, how often they carry out this report and what, what the headline is takeaways are this year? So the CST is the Community Security Trust and they are an organisation, a charity that monitor abuse and hate against Jewish people but they also try and ensure security for the Jewish community in the UK. They monitor this data and they bring out these annual reports. They've been doing it since the 80s so it's not new but the difficulty is that the report that's out this morning shows there's been a huge increase in anti-Semitic incidents, anti-Semitic abuse and attacks uh, in the past 12 months, partly very much driven since the 7th of October attack last year. So I'm going to talk you through some of the key stats of this report. It says there were more than 4,000 anti-Jewish hate incidents last year, the highest annual total the charity has ever recorded since it started uh, measuring this. Of the incidents reported, the CST says most of them, which is 66%, so two-thirds, occurred on or after the 7th of October when Hamas launched its attack in Israel. And last year's incidents tally uh, also represents a 147% rise in the record number of 2022. So it really paints a picture of quite a dire situation for where we are in the UK and the amount of abuse that Jewish people are having to live through on a daily basis. They also talk about in the report that actually a lot of the time with this anti-Semitic rhetoric that's being used, it's referring to Israel, it's referring to Palestine, and it's referring to that Hamas attack on the 7th of October. And one thing that's also quite startling is they talk about how 18% of the incidents uh, were essentially taken out, uh, perpetrated by youngsters, so people who were under the age of 18. And they're concerned that there's something going on in schools now with the amount of children perpetrating anti-Semitism here in the UK. So a very very depressing report for many Jewish people, probably not a surprising report uh, and very much evidence that there is a huge amount of work to do uh, in all corners of life here in the UK to make sure that Jewish people aren't being subjected to this barrage of abuse. Mark, uh, thanks so much for that. And of course, we were joined by Dr. Dave uh, Rich last hour and we'll replay a little bit of that later on in the show. But uh, for now, Gareth, time for the other lead stories.
Yes, we'll start with the United States, where at least one person has been killed and 21 others injured, including children, in a mass shooting at a Super Bowl parade. Fans of the Kansas City Chiefs had been celebrating the team's victory when shots sent panic through the crowd. Three people have been arrested, but officers are yet to determine a motive. Our US correspondent, Martha Kellner, has the details. See them pumping up the crowd there on the top of the bus. There's confetti! It was supposed to be a day of celebration. More than a million people cramming the streets of Kansas City to welcome home their Super Bowl winning team. One of its stars, Travis Kelsey, boyfriend of Taylor Swift, throwing a ball to fans. But then the party is pierced by gunshots. A mass of red shirts run in the direction of the city's Union Station. With so many people in such a small space, it's difficult to tell where the bullets are being fired from. We're in Kansas City, Missouri, and there is gunshots. One woman hiding under a car phones the police. Who's the other guy that helped me? Another parade goer tackles one of the presumed shooters. A Kansas City radio station says one of its DJs, Lisa Lopez, died in the shooting. The city's mayor was forced to run to safety too. I was there with my wife, I was there with my mother. Uh, we never would have thought that we, along with Chiefs players, along with fans, hundreds of thousands of people, would be forced to run for our safety today. There were 800 police patrolling the parade, but they couldn't prevent the bloodshed. Three people have now been arrested and investigators say the motive for the shooting isn't clear. It's not thought, though, to be terror-related. In a statement, Travis Kelsey said, I'm heartbroken over the tragedy that took place today. My heart is with all who came out to celebrate with us and have been affected. KC, you mean the world to me. This level of gun violence is all too common. This, the 48th mass shooting just this year. At an event to mark the country's biggest sporting victory, it is a uniquely American tragedy. Martha Kellner, Sky News. Lebanese security sources say six children are among 11 people killed by Israeli strikes in villages along the country's southern border yesterday. The strikes were Israel's response to a Hezbollah rocket attack that killed one of its soldiers. There's been no comment from the Foreign Office after a US Congresswoman's extraordinary remarks directed at the Foreign Secretary. The Republican right-winger Marjorie Taylor Greene was asked by Sky News about Lord Cameron drawing comparisons to the appeasement of Adolf Hitler as he urged Congress to pass a Ukraine aid package. Well, he likened you to an appeaser to Hitler in not voting through funding for Ukraine. Are you an appeaser for Putin? I, I think that um, I really don't care what David Cameron has to say. I think that's rude name calling um, and I don't appreciate that type of language. And David Cameron needs to worry about his own country and frankly he can kiss my ass. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex have spent Valentine's Day in Canada where they met athletes training for the Invictus Games which is taking place next year. Prince Harry, who founded the Paralympic-style sporting competition back in 2014, attempted sit-skiing. The couple plan to spend more visits, com uh, visit more competitors at the host locations for the 2025 competition. Some forms of exercise are just as good as therapy and medication in treating depression and should be considered a core treatment. That's according to Australian academics in a study published in the British Medical Journal who say the more vigorous the exercise, the better. But they also say low intensity activities like walking and yoga also had benefits. Gareth, thank you. Now, a suspect in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann is due to appear in a German court tomorrow to face trial over allegations of rape and sexual abuse of children. They relate to separate incidents which are said to have taken place in Portugal between 2000 and 2017. 45-year-old Christian B, who cannot be fully named uh, due to German privacy laws, hasn't been charged in the Madeleine McCann case and has denied any involvement. Uh, let's go live to our crime correspondent, Martin Brunt. So, Martin, uh, th this court case in Germany uh, begins when? It begins tomorrow. Um, it's going to be a, a short day. I think, effectively, we're going to get an outline of those charges and any potential response from Christian B. 
um, he has effectively been demonised over the last four years since he was identified as the suspect in the Madeleine McCann case. Uh, tomorrow's trial is nothing to do with the Madeleine case. It's a, a string of sex crimes the prosecution say were committed over the past 17 years. But because of this notoriety that, uh, that he's attracted in connection with the Madeleine McCann case, um, there are concerns that he may not get a fair trial. And that was something I put to a former lawyer of his in Portugal. Here's my report. According to the prosecutor, the suspect's sex crime stretched 30 miles along Portugal's Algarve coast and over two decades. German drifter Christian B, whose full identity is protected by privacy laws, denies all charges, among them on Salima Beach, a sex attack on a girl of 10. In his rented home, the rape of a teenage girl. Lawyer Seraphim Vieira once defended Christian B for stealing diesel. The year was 2006. Uh, the man that I knew then uh, is not the man that I got, uh, I found out to be or that is supposed to be. He seemed like uh, just a normal guy that uh, was traveling around Europe, uh, having a good time, eventually doing things that probably were not quite right, as many do. Since then, Christian B has become notorious. As well as the trial he faces this week, he's also the suspect in the disappearance of British girl Madeleine McCann. She vanished 17 years ago from the family's rented holiday apartment. He hasn't been charged over Madeleine and denies any involvement. What do you think the world thinks of Christian B? The worst, especially after the the um, the firm accusations of the German prosecutor that he did commit a crime about uh, related uh, Maddie McCann. Can he get a fair trial? I don't think so. Uh, I hope so, but uh, it's very. I think it's very difficult. In the resort of Prada Rocha, Christian B is accused of raping a young woman. He's said to have tied up an Irish holiday worker and subjected her to a prolonged ordeal. The alleged victim, Hazel Bean, thought after so long her case from 2004 would never be solved. She said in this statement that the Portuguese police didn't properly investigate her rape. I was told to go home by the police, she said. I was told it would ruin the holiday trade. She said she left the police station expecting an investigation, but heard nothing more. In a village in the hills above the coast, Christian B is accused of flashing at a young girl. Her mother has previously described what happened. His arrest there led to extradition to Germany and this week's trial, which is expected to last until the summer. The trial will be heard not by a jury, but by a panel of judges, and they, of course, are uh, considered to be immune from any prejudice uh, or any influence. So, first day of the trial tomorrow, and it may last until June. Martin, uh, thanks so much for that. Martin uh, Brunt there. Now, after a technical glitch, a private US moon lander successfully launched from NASA's Cape Canaveral base in Florida. Three, two... One, ignition, and liftoff. Go SpaceX, go IM-1 and the Odysseus lunar lander. The spacecraft, which is attached to a SpaceX rocket, is aiming to land on the south pole of the moon. There, scientists believe there could be billions of gallons of water. If all goes to plan, it would be the first American lunar touchdown since the last Apollo mission half a century ago. Uh, let's bring in our science correspondent, Thomas Moore. Tom, Thomas, I, as you know, I've got lots of questions on this. So my first, which we didn't get to last time, is the fact that we're saying, I think last hour you said it's epic that, that we're going to the moon again. But, I, I mean, as we just said, it's 50 years ago, 1969, we went there the first time. So why are we so uh, 
impressed that we're going back to a place that we got to in the 60s. Yeah, this is more than 50 years since the United States has been back. There have been other countries that have been back in the intervening period, but this is going to be now a rush uh, to the South Pole because that is the region where they believe there may be water ice. Now, even if you look at the, the sun-baked equator of the moon, where temperatures reach more than 120 degrees, you can find molecules of water buried in, in the lunar dust. It, it looks like a, a, a desert, a desolate place, as, as one of the astronauts called it. But there is water there. And it does seem to pool down in, in, in the South Pole region. Now, we don't know that for sure. And that's the excitement of these missions. There was, in 2009, a NASA spacecraft that smashed into the region. And they looked at the plume. They found evidence of water molecules in that plume. But we haven't seen it. And it's as these spacecraft go back and go into these uh, really deep craters, these craters of eternal darkness where the temperatures are minus 230 degrees, that we'll get our first sight, hopefully, of ice. In terms, in terms of just getting there, uh, two questions. Is that not easy, but given that we've done it before and many years ago, and presumably the technology is advanced, is it something we expect to go smoothly from here and uh, is the launch one of the hardest most complex parts making the rest less of a challenge or not? I think we have a level of expectation because satellite launches are so routine these days, but getting beyond near-Earth orbit out towards the Moon is much harder. And that was the, the point that the, the, the Peregrine mission uh, fell down last month. It didn't wake up properly. It, there was a problem with it, one of the valves in its propulsion system, uh, and the mission ended uh, rather swiftly. So far, things are looking good uh, for Odysseus on its uh, journey to the Moon. Um, but there's a long way to go. The, the southern region is much more cratered, bouldered. Uh, the, the, the lighting is, is much, much worse with very high contrast. And it's going to do all this itself, but it will be a perilous landing uh, on the 22nd of February. Really exciting. Uh, very exciting indeed, Thomas. And I'm being told that I'll be allowed at least two more questions next hour, but I have to wrap it again uh, for this hour. Thank you so much, as always. Uh, let's turn now to the rise of anti-Semitism in the UK after a report found the number of incidents recorded are at an all-time high. Well, earlier I spoke to Dr Dave Rich, Director of Policy at the Community Security Trust, a charity that carried out the research. I spoke to him about the difference between anti-Semitic hatred and ordinary criticism of Israel and its war in Gaza. The broad difference, I would say, is if someone wants to walk down the street in central London waving a Palestinian flag or shouting free Palestine, that's completely fine. That's just normal politics and protest. If they go and do it outside a synagogue, deliberately targeting that building because it's a Jewish house of prayer, or if they go up to random Jewish people in the street and scream free Palestine in their face. You know, we had an incident a few weeks ago where a Jewish teenager on his way home from school was put up against a wall, punched in the face and told, say free Palestine. Now, that's anti-Semitic. That's not just normal politics. Joining us now is Justin Cohen, the news editor at The Jewish News, and, and uh, joins us now. Justin, th this report is carried out annually. Um, what, what do you make in this significant pickup in, in this year's report? Well, first of all, those numbers, over 4,000 incidents, a 147% uh, rise on last year, have to be absolutely shocking. Over the last four months, I think Jews around the world have felt they've been on the front line of two battles. First of all, they've watched in absolute horror as our friends and family have felt, felt an unprecedented assault uh, by Hamas uh, in Israel. And then secondly, we've witnessed a dramatic and unprecedented rise in hatred towards the community on the streets of London and other capitals around the world. To some extent, this was expected. Every time that, that Israel's been forced into a war to defend itself, there's been a spike in anti-Semitic incidents uh, in the UK. But the ferociousness and the sheer number of incidents make this particularly shocking. I I've never known fear like this in the UK among British Jews. Do, do, I mean, it's funny you mentioned there uh, not funny, I don't mean that. Um, it's interesting you, you mentioned there the fact that it, it spikes every time there's a, there's a war. Um, I discussed that a little bit with Dr Dave Rich as well. Uh, not that it should excuse anything, but do you have some level of, of hope that things will die down again uh, if and when the conflict does uh, itself reach uh, closer to a conclusion? 
I think, sadly, this is here to stay for a while yet. The genie has been taken out of the bottle and is unlikely to be put straight back in. Let's be clear, as Dave Rich was saying before, this is not about protest against Israel. This is not about, you know, anti-settlement construction or anti-Benjamin Netanyahu. This is latent anti-Semitism. We need not look further than the first anti-Semitic incident that CST recorded after the, after the October the 7th attacks. A car driving past a synagogue in Hertfordshire, not far from where, where I am now, windows down, the driver waving a Palestinian flag and waving his fist in some kind of celebration. That was the response to the worst assault on Jews, the worst massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. Do, do you think it goes both ways uh, and that there's been a significant rise in, in hatred towards uh, Muslims or towards Palestinians? Uh, my understanding is there has been a rise in, uh, in, in Islamophobic incidents in the UK, but certainly not on the scale that we've seen uh, against Jews here. And we're talking about uh, a 4,000 incident. We've never seen anything like this, including 266 violent assaults. Again, we're not used to seeing that kind of number of, of violent assaults on Jews in the UK. Uh, Met Police data, by the way, a couple of months ago did say there's a 1,350% increase in anti-Semitic offences, 140% increase in Islamophobic um, incidences. Just finally, what, what would you like to see happen? Um, Dr Dave Rich said the first thing is just for people to stop being like this, um, which I thought was actually very interesting uh, and quite compelling, but also at the same time, it's, it's uh, not that tangible uh, in terms of guaranteeing that, that it'll take place. I think the most important thing is that when we do see these incidents, that the police the, and the Crown Prosecution crack down and ensure that prosecutions are carried through um, and that punishments are befitting of the crime to make sure that there's a deterrence here. Unfortunately, anti-Semitism has been with us for many centuries and isn't going to just disappear now. But people need to understand that targeting Jews in any way, even if they think they're defending Palestine in some way, is not uh, about defending Palestine. It's actually anti-Semitic. Justin Cohn, thanks for joining us. Let's have a look now at the weather. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly, the weather, to fly. sponsored by Qatar Airways. It'll be mostly very mild into the weekend, but will be rather unsettled. It's generally mild, but quite murky now, with hill fog and drizzly outbreaks for many, and heavier, more general rain over northern Britain and around the Irish Sea. Wales and Western England will see rain taking over this morning, heavy in the southwest, but uh, eastern England. Looks mainly dry with sunny spells developing. Scotland will have further rain, while Ireland and Northern Ireland will see patchy rain giving way to sunny spells. To fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Still to come here on The Breakfast Show, how a self-funded community mental health service is providing much-needed support to Britain's youth. Plus, a call for parents to return to the classroom to better benefit their children and what do these mean to you? Apparently how we interpret emojis changes based on gender and age. Thank you. How on earth did you guys get all of us women in one room together? 40 people together to shoot the cover of Vogue, Edward. It's an insane concept. My action, whenever Edward asks anything, is always, you know, yes, let's see, and let's see what's possible. I didn't actually think it would really uh, come together in the way that I did, if I'm really honest, but I said, great, that's a fantastic idea, let's see what we can do. It was a lot like a military operation. Um, we had an amazing team working on it. You know, it wasn't just me, I had amazing colleagues also working on it, um, and Edward went out basically to all of these amazing women who had previously been on his covers during his tenure. And he wrote to them all personally, um, you know, to ask them if they would take part. And, you know, then the, the sort of the yeses started coming in and we just um, just started building it from there, you know, starting with one day and then um, 
just saying to everyone, this is the day you've got to be there. It was really was amazing. And Edward kept adding people as, you know, as people said, yes, he wanted it to be this amazing, really um, diverse, incredible group. I think we started off thinking maybe it would be sort of 20. And, you know, I'd wake up the next morning and he would be like, oh, you know, Oprah said yes, or, you know, Miley said yes, or Naomi said yes, and then suddenly it would be 30, and then it was 35, and then everyone was like, wouldn't it be nice if it was 40? Um, so, yeah, that's how it kind of grew incrementally. It was amazing. It really was, like, such an incredible day. It was, you know, it was really emotional for, like, for a lot of us who worked with Edward, you know, um, who've been with him right from the beginning, so it really kind of felt kind of coming full circle in that way. It was just everyone was everyone was there for Edward. And so it really felt like such a special, special moment. And everyone was really there for him rather than being there, you know, for themselves or to promote something. So it really felt, you know, just incredible. I think it just it sort of says everything um, that all of those people would come and, and be there for him um, to celebrate what he did at, at British Vogue during his time. I think that's, you know, that picture just like really says it all because everyone just came together to give their time so freely and you know just, just just to make an amazing amazing image Welcome back to The Breakfast Show. Well, uh, coming up, a suggestion that parents should return to the classroom and could it benefit children? Plus, how a community-run facility is helping deal with the NHS backlog in mental health cases. But first, uh, let's return to those comments, shall we, guys, uh, made by US Republican uh, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene relating to an article that David Cameron has written in The Hill. It's an online publication uh, in D.C. to try and urge... Uh, Republicans to pass funding for Ukraine. Let's watch it back. Well, he likened you to an appeaser to Hitler in not voting through funding for Ukraine. Are you an appeaser for Putin? I, I think that um, I really don't care what David Cameron has to say. I think that's rude name calling, um, and I don't appreciate that type of language. And David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. Uh, a great doorstep there from, from James Matthews, obviously. And I, I was, I saw that first before reading the article, and I thought, OK, how provocative was David Cameron's article, actually? And it is quite provo provocative. It includes the line, I'm going to drop all diplomatic niceties. I urge Congress to pass it. So, you know, w w was it being exaggerated uh, and leading to that? I don't think it was. I think he was trying to make a point, and I think... Uh, considering the issue at play here and considering the fact that funding has been so stalled in the House of Representatives, despite the fact that Senate's passed what was around $90 billion worth, not just for Ukraine, but for other... The pressure does need to be ramped up when you hear the warnings from people like the Norwegians that, that Russia is massively on mm -hmm. the offensive and, and has the upper hand in Ukraine. And let's be honest, we've seen $44 billion come out of the Americans so far already. The general consensus is that the US does need to do the most of the heavy lifting. Pressure needs to be applied. Mm. I think the interesting thing here as well, Mari, is if this bill is now successful, uh, David Cameron has stuck his neck out and will get some credit for helping. And, and don't forget his first uh, trip, you know, he went to the US's second foreign trip. He went to specifically the capital, mm. not necessarily to, to the White House, when I was there uh, with him in, in December, to, to try and lobby exactly these sorts of Republicans in the House who are the ones... Um, holding it up. And uh, I guess the expectation is that the bill won't be passed. And by sticking his neck out, if it is, then maybe he'll claim a, a little bit of a, a, a diplomatic coup. At the end of the day, let's not forget, uh, legacy is always a contributing factor, especially when you're a politician who there's a possibility he might be out of a job before the end of this year. So he has a short window to kind of secure his legacy as Foreign Secretary and former PM. And therefore, to an extent, he can take maybe slightly more risks than others. He's not an MP. 
he's in the House of Lords, so he's not a, he's not an elected MP. He knows he's going to be a peer for life. And so I think that also contributes to the fact that he's therefore got the flexibility to take more risks, perhaps, mm -hmm. than it were he just to be an MP. And time is ticking if the polls are to be believed. Now, I think the other thing that's interesting is, to an extent, her comments might contribute to an international nervousness around uh, whether the US is going to bring in that aid funding or not to Ukraine. We know there's been lots of murmurings and uh, concerns across NATO and across Europe. But I also think, nonetheless, David Cameron's a very experienced politician. He's been in the business a long time, and he will have been very, very strategic about exactly what he wrote in that piece. But, but interesting, I mean, I hope he's also made a phone call direct to the one person that really matters in, the, in all of this, which is the Speaker, Mike. Johnson, because there is a sufficient number of votes on the floor of Congress to pass this. The question is whether the bill gets to the floor or, or whether Mike Johnson, who's seen as having sort of similar Trump-like uh, uh, views as Marjorie Taylor Greene, who we just saw in and that, wants to block the bill so that Biden doesn't get seen to have a, a victory before that. And of course, as you said, it's already passed at the Senate. The other big swing factor from December, by the way, when Cameron did have quite a warm meeting with Speaker Mike Johnson, is that the EU has... Uh, approved its funding, which changes the debate because mm -hmm. back then there's also this very quite often disappointment from US lawmakers being like, well, you guys fund it too. And and the difference is they have now. So we'll, we'll see if it passes. Not expected to pass. Not enough was made of the managing to get past that Hungarian bloc, I don't think. Mm -hmm. that, was a, that was a huge uh, achievement for the European Union. Let's remind you, though, of our top stories this morning. The UK economy has officially entered a recession. Gross domestic product contracted by 0.3% in the final three months of last year. More than expected, that followed an earlier economic contraction between July and September. More than 4,000 cases of anti-Semitism were recorded in the UK last year. That was an all-time high. The Jewish charity behind the findings say there was a marked increase after the October Hamas attacks on Israel. One person has been killed and at least 21 others injured at a shooting in the United States. Crowds had gathered for the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl victory parade when gunshots were heard. Three people remain in custody. And a private US moon lander has successfully launched on board a SpaceX rocket en route to the moon in search of water. Gareth, thank you. Uh, now, Holiday Park has been found to have racially discriminated against Irish travellers by instructing staff to cancel or decline bookings of individuals with traditional Irish names or Irish accents. Let's bring in our correspondent, Alice Porter. Alice, uh, quite extraordinary this. What exactly uh, have they been found to be in breach of? Well, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, they did an investigation into Pontins. This is the, uh, the Holiday Park at the, at the heart of this scandal. And they had a whistleblower came forward in 2020 who said that there had been discrimination against travellers, against gypsies, and in particular, Irish travellers. And they did uh, an investigation and their findings have been published today. And they really are pretty shocking if we take you through them. Firstly, staff were instructed to decline or cancel bookings made under certain Irish names labelled undesirable. We understand the whistleblower actually sent a list of 40 Irish names that were put on the list. Then call centre staff were told to listen out for Irish accents and decline or cancel their bookings. Guests identified as Irish travellers were put on a no longer welcome database to ensure future bookings would be de denied. And rules were introduced to require guests to appear on the electoral register, a practice found to be discriminatory against travellers who are less likely to be registered. And so the Equality and Human Rights Commission concluded that Pontins broke the law on several occasions. Alice Porter, great stuff, thanks so much. Uh, we should just uh, mention as well the response uh, that uh, came as well from uh, Pontins, the call centre uh, where, if we can roll that down please guys, uh, the call centre where the incidents took place uh, has closed. And the majority of the staff involved have now left Pontins. We apologise to all who may have been affected. Pontins is committed to ensuring ongoing compliance with the Equality Act 2010. Now, Sky News has been told that underinvestment in children's mental health services is resulting in immediate suffering for thousands of youngsters in the UK. In a bid to curb the backlog and get patients seen, the NHS is now referring individuals to community-run clinics. 
Our people's, uh, people and politics correspondent Nick Martin has been to one of those centres which funds its own counsellors to help teenagers who cannot get an appointment with the NHS. A warning, this report has references to suicide and self-harm. Sebastian is 11 years old and nothing makes him happier than being out on a court because bullying in school led him into a dark place. People were really badly kicking me. They were making me bleed and it hurt a lot and it was happening for a long time. So I got a sudden idea that I wanted to, to cut myself because I didn't want to exist. I thought that maybe without me, the school will be better and everyone will forget about me. Sebastian's story takes us to the heart of a mental health crisis affecting hundreds of thousands of children. I feel very bad because uh, the most important thing ever in my life is to get my to see my child happy. Sebastian's GP didn't refer him to the NHS's Children and Adolescent Mental Health Service, CAMS for short. He was referred here, a community centre. We have parents coming in here who don't know where to go. They're crying out for help. What does it say about the system that referrals are now coming to you, a charity effectively? It says that there's a, it's broken. The system is broken. Just under half a million children and young people in England are currently on mental health waiting lists, 85% higher than before the pandemic. It's very normal that we have food banks because people can't afford to eat. There's a, you know, there's a cost of living crisis. Go to a food bank, it's becoming the same for mental health. So there's a food bank down the road dishing out beans and pasta. Mm -hmm. This is like a mental health bank dishing mm -hmm. out support and counselling. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. But the Jade Centre receives no funding from the NHS, despite the NHS sending patients here. The NHS says they're treating record numbers of young people for their mental health, and the Department for Health and Social Care told us they're investing an additional $2.3 billion a year into mental health services. Sebastian looks much more happy now, more calm. This is about as far from a clinical setting as you can get. Yet the NHS and others are now relying on places like these to help desperate children and their declining mental health before it's too late. Nick Martin, Sky News, Rotherham. Well, if you or someone you know have been affected by the issues raised in Nick's report, you can contact the Samaritans helpline on 116123 or email joe at samaritans.org. Now, there's a suggestion that parents should be offered lessons in topics such as cooking and reading to better help their children pro progress in life. Let's uh, speak uh, to uh, maths teacher, author and broadcaster Bobby Siegel uh, about this. Very good morning to you. Thanks good for morning. joining us. So, so what, what exactly are we talking about here? The idea that uh, parents should help more in, in their ch children's education just at home or, or even further than that? Even both. And I, I think actually to understand this, we should actually look at the meaning of the word to educate, and it comes from the Latin educare. And the decare is. Tell to... you're a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, less than always. The decare is to lead or draw, and the e is out, so to lead or draw out. So, as an educator, the school system should be about drawing out knowledge, skills, and abilities of young people so they can lead. Um, fulfilling and interesting lives that actually can make a positive contribution to their families, communities, and wider society. And if we're thinking, Parents are a big part of that because children after school, they go home, they need to be part of a supportive and engaging environment. And again, as a teacher, what I find is you can often tell the students that do well by just meeting their parents in a parent's teaching. So actually trying to engage parents itself, I think, is a good idea. Are we saying that at the moment that we don't do that very well as a nation? Uh, did we used to do it well and now we don't? Are parents sort of switched off or, or what? what? What's the sort of... Point on this. Yeah, I think society is more complicated. Parents have got multiple more responsibilities to deal with. So actually dealing with their children's education at home is something perhaps they're not used to doing as well. So I think it's 
Again, as an educator, I think I applaud measures where we, in principle, say, yes, let's get parents involved with children's education. But again, the question I post on my social media, other teachers said to me, Bobby, where's the time for this? We're already under the cosh in terms of budget, um, teaching ratios, uh, lots of demands on schools. So I think this is a, in principle, a good thing. Again, the question is, the cynic will say, where do we find space in school education to add things like cookery and reading for parents? But, but, and and this, is, this is to teach the parents, the teachers teach the parents, or to get the parents into the teaching parts of school so that they're there's more overlap and it's all a, a bit more kind of centralised? I think it's more the former. I think it's the concept is to get parents in, to equip them with skills in cookery and reading in schools so that actually they are more engaged parts of the community. Because if parents are coming in and seeing in their school environments, oh yes, I can see why reading is important, I can see why cooking is important. When they go back home, they're actually going to have conversations. Oh, did you read uh, Lord of the Rings? Uh, or oh, did you learn how to cook that tagliatelle to the children? So I think it's getting that engagement piece with parents. Um, in terms of the balance that, uh, even if we focus specifically on, on a very clear subject like maths, mm -hmm. which, which you teach, how much does a child get from their parents versus uh, their teacher? I mean, still presumably very heavily skewed to, to, to school and, and teachers as opposed to, you know, life lessons and stuff which might be more at home. Absolutely, and I would say with maths, for example, or any subject, there's two parts. There's the competency and there's the attitude. Schools, our job is to teach the competency, you know, the basic skills of arithmetic, fractions, decimals, percentages. But at home, a lot of the parents' attitudes will rub off on children. If a mom or dad says, oh, I, I don't read, oh, I hated maths at school, that rubs off and that can actually impact children's learning. So I think it's that attitudinal piece. If parents are more uplifted, and we all know parents that are really positive about their child's education, I think mm -hmm. that child has a much greater chance to succeed and again, therefore, adding value to society later on. Bobby, thanks so much. Pleasure. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Still to come here on The Breakfast Show, the UK recession, what does it mean for your finances? We'll get expert advice next.
Welcome back to The Breakfast Show. Well, coming up, uh, are you using emojis correctly? We'll discuss that uh, because apparently we interpret the cartoon figures differently based on age and gender and eyesight. It can be quite hard to tell the differences sometimes. We'll have a chat about that uh, a little bit later on this morning. But first, uh, breaking news this morning that the UK entered a recession uh, at the end of last year. So what does it mean for your finances? Joining me now, consumer expert Harry Kind. Harry, firstly, your, your take on the fact that we are now in a recession. The data this morning was, was worse than expected. It, it was. It's not quite, I mean, to put it in emoji, poo emoji. It's probably a slightly sad face emoji. And... In amongst those figures, we there's might... There's a lot of different sad faces. There's a lot of... Diff it's a mild sad face. Okay. But actually, on the front, you might think this is quite flat because really it's a, we're going to hear a lot of technical recession thrown around today. What I'm interested in when it comes to living standards for people up and down the country is the GDP per capita. And that we have seen fall quite significantly, 0.7% down in the last year, while GDP as a, an aggregate is up 0.1%. So really... We have hidden this kind of decline in the economy by an increase in, in population. And that is seven consecutive quarters now of a decline in GDP per capita, which is going to be troubling. That, that's very interesting. You're right that very, very few people focus on that. Um, so, so thank you for highlighting it to us. When we heard the, the, the brief clip from the Chancellor this mm. morning, he kind of focused more on inflation and mm. saying that that's what matters for people's living standards and we have half that, et cetera, et cetera. Is that a fair point to make? I, I think that is fair for a lot of people. You know, I think GDP numbers, they're a little bit like saying, how is your Christmas? And responding, well, the UK saw 200 million litres of rain. It really is an, an aggregate that doesn't reflect people's lived experiences. Uh, for a lot of people, the main figure from the last week that will be important to them was that food prices are finally falling. Even though they're up 29%, we are seeing that decline, and that will be a relief for a lot of families. But the Citizens Advice Bureau has actually just come up with uh, statistics saying that there are 5 million people who are in negative budgets, who are basically bringing in less than they are spending. And so in amongst that growing GDP, they should really, uh, the shrinking GDP rather, they should be worried. What does the year ahead look like? Because, you know, again, we talk about inflation, we talk about expectations for it. A lot mm. of people think it's going to fall quite a lot in the coming months, and, and obviously energy prices are something we've talked about within that. Well, it's a, it's a, we are seeing really weird economic figures at the moment. The indicators are all over the place because consumer confidence, people's feeling about the future, is growing. People are more optimistic. And we are seeing, you know, unemployment at quite a low figure, relatively speaking. And yet the number of people, for example, in the labour market is... To, you know, there are 2.8 million, 2 million people who are off sick long term. So those people really, if they are able to get back to work, that will be a, you know, a boost to their own personal finances. We are seeing inflation come down. That will boost a lot of families' finances. But we can't you know, lose the fact that there are people who are still struggling with energy costs being high, with food costs being high. So one of the factors we also talk a lot about is interest rates, obviously. Mm. And for those that have mortgages, uh, that's particularly... Uh, relevant. Um, the data this week, does it support the likelihood of interest rate cuts from the Bank of England going forward? I mean, I know we don't want mm. a recession, but a slightly softer economy, I guess, will give an impetus to cut interest rates. It, it would. The kind of the, the talk out there is that there's no expected cut anytime soon, because although this has been a soft-ish landing, um, really there's no rush to cut these interest rates. And actually, we've only seen about 50% of the pain of these interest rates when it comes to mortgages. 50% of people who are on a fixed-term mortgage are actually still experiencing those lovely kind of low rates that we saw before the cost of living crisis. So there's still a lot of that pain to come that's baked in. I think if inflation really does drop significantly, they, the Bank of England will change their minds. But I don't think anytime soon we're going to see any rate drops. Harry Kind, great stuff. Thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, well, let's have a quick look at the weather before we leave you. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. It'll be uh, mostly very mild into the weekend, but it will be rather unsettled. It's generally mild, but uh, quite murky now with hill fog and drizzly outbreaks for many. Uh, heavier, uh, more general rain over northern Britain will be around and across the Irish Sea. That's your weather. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.
Well, as we mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about emojis uh, and now. Uh, what exactly do they mean? Because apparently uh, we all interpret them fairly differently. That's between men and women. Uh, and between different age groups, scientists say, it's because the digital pictures can be ambiguous and open to different meanings. They found women were more able to accurately deduce happy, fearful, sad and angry emojis. Well, presumably we can all tell if it's happy or angry, can't we? <laughs> it's, it's these details in between. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, different versions and scales of good or bad. Positive. And it's the context. So depending Definitely. on how, you know, you could send the sunglasses emoji when you're on holiday having a great time, but you could send the sunglasses emoji when someone's having a go at you because he didn't take the bins out, and that's quite disrespectful. Oh, why would you do so, sunglasses for that? To say, I don't care. Look at me. I'm putting my shades on. Think about it. You know, the context mm -hmm. is massive. So apparently <laughs> the disgusted face was the one that people confused the most. They didn't quite understand what it meant, but I think it comes back Which to what you... Which disgusting face? With the, with the, the, show, with the... show it to us with your face. <laughs> I, I can't. With you both in the room, I could never look disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Impossible. So, I could only do the sunglasses emoji. So the bigger question I have is, how do you just go into the emoji part and pick an emoji, or do you sometimes write out in text the word you're going to say, and it tells, it gives you the option to press the yeah. emoji? That obviously gives you the more... I, I often do that, and I'm like... God, I didn't know that one matched up with that word. That's true. But then when you go into that, there's just so many of them as well to it's pick up. It's a bit out. of a minefield. I bit mean, of I'm a... that generation where, like, I love emojis. What do you think, what's your most used emoji? Probably just the laughing, crying emoji. My, mine is definitely this one. The hands up. Are we oh, only talking about okay. facial emojis or yeah. not? Okay. You know, it's like good news, you're like, yeah. respect. I, is it meant to be praising, like, well done you? You're or just is very it... deferential, aren't you? I think very it's... deferential. Well, the, the, the arrows are going up, so I think it's like, yeah. off the roof. <laughs> a bit more I, I also, <laughs> yes, it, it all can be different things. I'm probably using the wrong one. I use it a lot. We're out of time. Thanks so much for watching. We've got one more hour. Stay with us.
very good morning to you. It is nine o'clock coming up on today's show. The UK economy is officially in recession. Plus, a man suspected of abducting Madeleine McCann to go on trial in Germany in a separate sex crime case. And the academics suggesting exercise is a core treatment for depression, saying it could be better than medication. Lots to come uh, today on the 15th of February. Let's remind you of the headlines. The UK falls into recession as the economy shrinks more than expected. We've got reaction from the Chancellor as well as Labour and the Lib Dems. A Jewish charity records more than 4,000 anti-Semitic incidents in 2023, an unprecedented number it describes as an explosion in hatred. We're in Kansas City, Missouri. Oh, there is good chance. One person killed and 21 injured, including children, after a Super Bowl celebration becomes the latest backdrop for an American mass shooting. No comment from the Foreign Office after US Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene's undiplomatic response to the Foreign Secretary's intervention on Ukraine aid. David Cameron needs to worry about his own country, and frankly, he can kiss my ass. Moonshot, Three, SpaceX's two, Falcon one, rocket blasts off ignition. on a mission that no private and business has managed so far, a successful SpaceX, lunar go, lander. One and Odysseus lunar lander. Hey. Very good morning to you. Uh, the UK has officially entered a recession. Uh, it comes as GDP, gross domestic product, shrank by 0.3% in the final quarter of last year, which follows a contract contraction of 0.1% in the three months uh, from July to September. Here's the Chancellor. We always expected growth to be weaker while we prioritised tackling inflation. That means higher interest rates. And that's the right thing to do because you can't have long-term healthy growth with high inflation. But also for families, uh, when, the, when there's a cost of living crisis, when the cost of their weekly shop is going up, their energy bills are much higher, it's the right thing to do. The underlying picture here is an economy that is more resilient than most people predicted. Inflation is coming down. Real wages have been going up now for six months. And if we stick to our guns, independent forecasters say that by the early summer, we could start to see interest rates falling. And that will be a very important relief for families with mortgages. Well, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, has posted on X saying, Rishi Sunak has failed to turn the corner on 14 years of Tory economic decline. Britain is hit by a recession and it's working people who'll pay the price. Meanwhile, Liberal Democrat leader Sir Ed Davey had this to say. Rishi's recession has savaged the British economy by decimating growth and leaving families to cope with spiralling prices. Years of Conservative chaos and a revolving door of Conservative chancellors has culminated in economic turmoil. It's hard-working Brits forced to pick up the tab for this mess through high food prices, tax hikes and skyrocketing mortgage bills. Let's uh, bring in uh, our political business correspondent, Gurpreet Narwan, uh, who uh, just uh, briefly sat down with uh, the Chancellor. And Gurpreet, the headline here is a recession, of course, confirmed by two quarters in a row of negative uh, growth, but also that the data itself for the most recent time period was worse than expected. And we talk about small margins here, but a decline of 0.3% is not nothing. Yeah, Jeremy Hunt uh, just now was trying to put a positive spin on this, saying that the priority is actually inflation, getting that down, and low growth is part and parcel of that. But I think there's no getting away from the fact that these are very disappointing figures. Minus 0.3%. That was worse than the minus 0.1% forecast by economists, and it comes off the back of a 0.1% contraction in the third quarter as well, meaning we've met that technical uh, definition of a recession. But I guess the question is, does it radically change, or lead to a reinterpretation of uh, the past six months? And, and I think there the answer is probably not. Uh, instead of getting distracted about whether we're in a recession or not, I think it's fair to say the economy has been stagnant for a pretty long time. We've, over the past two years, got accustomed to reporting figures like 0.1%, minus 0.1%, 0%. None of these are inspiring figures and we're all feeling it. Our living standards are declining, mortgage costs are rising, rents are going up, people are dipping into their savings. And I think what is so illustrative 
Of that is one of the figures that came out of these releases, this release. GDP per capita, minus 0.7% decline over the past year. That's what really matters for our living standards. And it's been the longest unbroken streak of negative GDP per capita uh, on record, since records began in the 1950s. So pretty difficult to put a positive spin on that too. And it's embarrassing for the Chancellor and for the government because Rishi Sunak, he made a really big sell of the fact that he was going to sort out the economy, sort out the mess of his predecessor, predecessor that him and, and Jeremy Hunt were going to steady the ship. And one of his five pledges was that he would have the economy growing. We can expect that Labour uh, will be uh, taking the opportunity today to point that out. Uh, if there is some good news in all of this, it's that we've probably already turned the corner on this recession. It's likely to be a shallow one. Uh, as the Chancellor pointed out, inflation is broadly coming down. We can expect some interest rate cuts uh, from the Bank of England uh, in the middle of this year. All of that will likely leave more pe money in people's pockets, uh, more money for them to spend in the economy, which should boost growth. That, at least, is the message that's coming out of the Treasury today. Well, Gurpreet, uh, let's listen to that message directly. There'd been initially a little bit of a problem with the tape, but it's ready now. This is Gurpreet's sit-down moments ago with the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. We always expected that growth would be weaker while we were tackling high inflation. Um, that means that interest rates are going to be higher. That's the right thing to do because high inflation is a massive pressure on family budgets. It means the cost of the weekly shop is much higher than it would otherwise have been. But it also makes it possible for businesses to grow sustainably. So the primary objective is to bring down inflation. And actually, if you look at the underlying data in the economy, we are succeeding in doing that much faster than many people predicted. It's fallen from 11% to 4%. Many people thought it wouldn't hit the Bank of England's 2% target for a year. Um, it now looks like it might do that in the next few months. And when that happens, you can start to bring down interest rates and start to get the much healthier growth that we all want. Uh, living standards, they still haven't returned to their pre-pandemic levels. This is the stuff that people really care about. Wages still aren't back to where they were in real terms uh, before the financial crisis. Are you proud of how the Conservatives, not just your government, have handled the economy? Well, if you look at what's happened since 2010, uh, the economy has grown faster than France, Germany, Italy, Japan, many other similar countries. We've actually Not created... The US, no, the US has grown faster. And I do believe that in the long run, uh, lower taxed economies tend to grow faster, which is why I started to bring down taxes in the autumn statement. But since then, we've also uh, created 800 jobs for every single day that we've been in office. We've given the UK a, a technology industry, the industry of the future, that is double the size of Germany, is three times the size of France. But notwithstanding that, we've also had a pandemic. We've had a Ukraine war that has meant that inflation rose to more than 11%. So the primary challenge since I became Chancellor, the most important thing that I can do to relieve pressure on families is to bring down that inflation rate. It's come down from 11% to 4%. Yeah. That's also very important for businesses that are trying to grow and expand. And that is why we need to stick to our guns and independent forecasters say if we do that, uh, inflation will come down to its target in a matter of months. Okay, and then so we can start to see interest rates falling. Great. And so let's talk about tax cuts because you say you believe that tax cuts are the way to grow the economy. Can we expect some more tax cuts uh, in the budget in the coming weeks? And where will they be? Well, you will know that um, chances don't talk about budgets just a few weeks before. And that's for a very good reason, because I don't yet know the final numbers um, that I'm, I will receive from the Office for Budget Responsibility. But what I would say is that um, I do believe, if you look around the world, that the economies, as we were talking about, like uh, the United States and Canada, uh, which have lighter taxes, particularly lighter taxes on business, tend to grow faster but I would only cut taxes in a way that was responsible. And I certainly wouldn't do anything that fueled inflation just when we're starting to have some success in bringing down inflation. OK, so let's talk about responsible tax cuts. Um, there's obviously taxation. There's also spending. Your spending plans um, that are currently in place have been described by some as a work of fiction. Um, unprotected budgets in the five years to 2028 are set for a 16% real terms cut. Are you prepared to constrain 
public spending even further to fund tax cuts? Well, you'll have to wait for the budget um, for the, the decision that the Prime Minister and I uh, eventually make. Um, but what I would say is that I was Health Secretary for nearly six years. I negotiated a lot of extra money for the NHS. I'm a passionate supporter of the NHS and all our public services. But in the long run, the best thing that I can do as Chancellor for the NHS is to make sure that our economy is growing healthily. So what you will see in everything I do in the budget on March the 6th is prioritising economic growth. And we have a plan uh, that we are sticking to, which is bringing down inflation and unlocking the potential for growth. May I say, in stark contrast to the Labour Party that has just abandoned the central plank of their economic plan, they don't have a plan. Uh, this is a time when we need to stick to our guns. The IMF is saying that you should not be cutting taxes. Are they wrong? Well, um, you know, lots of independent commentators have different views. Um, what they should do and everyone else needs to do is to wait until the budget. And then what you will see is the United Kingdom prioritising economic growth so that we can relieve pressure on families up and down the country who have been going through a very difficult period. So tax cuts in the budget would be responsible? As you know, chances don't talk about the contents of budgets. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that has been a convention for many, many decades. Um, but what I will say is that we would only ever cut taxes in a way that is responsible. The Chancellor there speaking to Gurpreet Narwan uh, just a moment ago. By the way, the Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves will be holding a press conference at 11 a.m. this morning. Uh, and uh, we'll have that live, of course, uh, on Sky News today. We're going to pivot now and go to Warsaw, Poland. David Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, is uh, visiting uh, uh, the Polish Foreign Minister, Radoslaw uh, Sikorski. And we're going to listen in just a little bit uh, to this joint press conference. Even identical positions in the crucial areas of security and Eastern policy. Together we advocate maintaining strong transatlantic relations and strengthening NATO's deterrence and defence capacity. We cooperate closely in the area of counter-terrorism as well as combating organized crime and disinformation. We cooperate in international forums to promote democracy and expand the sphere of security. Close cooperation with the UK is crucial from the point of view of our political, economic, defence interests, as well as the huge Polish community in the United Kingdom. The key subject of our discussions uh, today was the most pressing issue, which is maintaining peace and stability in Europe and the world. We talked about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has been ongoing for two years, and the resulting potential threats to the security of Europe. Foreign Secretary Cameron needs no convincing that Putin's aggressive policy poses a threat not only to the statehood of Ukraine but to the security of the entire continent. Stopping Russian imperialism is a fundamental condition for preserving the freedom and value system of the civilized world. The United Kingdom, like Poland, has, from the very beginning, unwaveringly supported Ukraine in its fight for the right to self-determination. We talked about concrete steps we want to take together in the coming weeks to strengthen Ukraine's defense capabilities. I also uh, discussed my efforts at EU level to increase the production capacity of the arms industry in the European Union member states. We have also exchanged uh, national uh, lessons in terms of uh, enforcing sanctions imposed by our countries and the EU on Russia. I'm very happy with this uh, visit. We will continue uh, our efforts uh, tomorrow in, at the Munich Security Conference. Thank you very much once again to the Foreign Secretary, uh, and I would like to kindly ask him to convey my best wishes for a speedy recovery to His Majesty King Charles. Well, thank you very much, um, Radek. It's great to be with you again. As you say, we've had several conversations since you've got your new job and I've got my new job. Uh, it's great to be back in Poland. I had 
made several visits to this country as Prime Minister, and I'm very proud to be back here as Foreign Secretary. And it's good to see that the British-Polish relationship is in such a strong position, a strong position diplomatically, economically, in terms of our cooperation on, on so many levels. And let me, as you did, pay tribute to the over 700,000 Polish people who live in the United Kingdom and make such an incredible contribution um, to our country. In fact, one of the ways they've contributed so well, and I've seen this firsthand, is, is the um, over 300,000 Ukrainians we've welcomed into the UK. The Polish community has played an absolutely key role in helping them to access services and to find homes and to find work and to find um, a solid future in the United Kingdom. So we, we pay tribute to them. Um, we're partners in so many ways. We are very strong NATO partners. Indeed, there are 400 British troops serving here uh, in Poland. Uh, we want to see a stronger NATO, as you do. Um, you're making huge commitments on defence spending, which we applaud. And both of us are delighted to see Finland join NATO. We want to see Sweden join NATO. Uh, we urge um, our Hungarian counterpart to uh, make that happen as soon as possible. I think the strengthening of NATO in this difficult and dangerous and uncertain world is one of the best things that we can do, not just for European security, but for um, global security. We're very strong economic partners. Our trade has reached over £30 billion. That is at record levels, and we want to continue to uh, make that expand. As you said, Radak, we're also partners in fighting organised crime and in fighting illegal migration. We both face challenges in this regard, and I think it is important to look at new ways that we can combat illegal migration and demonstrate to our countries and to our publics that we have this under control and that migration is working in our own nation's uh, benefit and that people can't uh, jump queues and migrate uh, illegally. Uh, of course, most important, what we discussed today, is our partnership in supporting Ukraine. I see this as the challenge of our generation. Two foreign ministers standing here today, uh, it's like two foreign ministers standing here in the 1930s, where we faced a similar challenge from a similar aggressive dictator who was trying to change Europe's boundaries by force, who was ignoring the sovereignty and inviolability of other countries' borders. That's what we face today with Putin. And the challenge is, do we have the political will to match it? It's perfectly obvious that we've got the military sort of power. It's perfectly obvious we've got the economic power, that we have the diplomatic power, that collectively our economies outmatch Russia by 25 to 1. The question for us is whether we have the political will. I know that Poland does, I know that Britain does, and we'll do everything we can to persuade all our allies to commit to helping Ukraine in all the ways that we are doing. Because we know our history. The last time we allowed a dictator in Europe to aggressively invade other countries without there being proper consequences, it was Poland that suffered the most. Indeed, Poland wasn't fully liberated for a further 50 years after that took place. And um, I think we should all bear that in mind when we look at the dangers of what Putin is doing in Ukraine and the need to get behind um, that country. So we've had great discussions on how we ramp up defence production, how we keep the flow of arms to Ukraine, how we keep that diplomatic support, that economic support, that moral support. We've signed our security partnership with Ukraine. I know that Poland is going to be doing that shortly. We urge every country to do that. And above all, because of their strength and power in the world, we applaud what the EU's already done uh, for uh, Ukraine. But because of their strength and power in the world, we really do want to see um, Congress pass that money to support Ukraine uh, economically, but crucially militarily, uh, in the months ahead. We saw yet again yesterday uh, in the Black Sea the huge success that Ukraine is having against Putin's Russia. They have now sunk 20%, over 20%, of Russia's Black Sea fleet. And as a result, Ukraine is exporting grain again, the Ukrainian economy is growing again, the Black Sea is open again. So when people talk about stalemate, there's no stalemate on the Black Sea. And we have to do everything we can to make sure that Ukraine can succeed in this year and beyond, that we must not let Putin think he can outweigh us uh, or last us out. And that's why this vote in Congress is so crucial. And I say this as someone who is not wanting in any way to 
lecture American friends or tell American friends what to do, I say it as someone who has a deep and abiding love of the United States, of their democracy, of their belief in freedom, but as someone who really believes in the importance of our alliance. To me, it's very personal. I remember the stories my grandfather told of fighting after D-Day under the support of American warships. I think of what I did with the American president to clear ISIL out of Iraq and Syria. When Britain and Europe and America, when we stand together, when we fight together, when we stand up for freedom, when we stand against aggression, when we stand with our partners, we can't be defeated. That's what's necessary this time. And it's not just a European issue. There will be other people watching what the Americans do. They will be watching in China. They will be watching in Iran. And every country around the world will be watching to say, are we these Western countries, are we reliable allies? When we say we're going to back you, when we say your right to resist aggression, when we say your right to defend your country, when we say your right to defend your borders, are we with you, not just today and tomorrow and for months, but are we with you until your aggressor has lost? That's the question for us. That is what Radek and I believe, and that is what we hope the Americans will vote for in Congress. Thank you. Well, we're going to monitor the question and answer part of uh, this press conference, uh, but I want to bring in here for reaction our international affairs editor, Dominic Waghorn. Dominic, uh, quite a broad set of comments there from Lord Cameron, starting about specifically the relationship between the UK and Poland, obviously broadened out there at the end. And we kind of got a, a summarised version of this article. We were talking about it earlier in the show. These are written in The Hill uh, that was published today to try and urge particularly Republican uh, members of Congress to pass... Uh, their bill for more funding for Ukraine. Obviously, overnight, that led to James Matthews doorstepping Marjorie Taylor Greene, and uh, uh, she uh, said that David Cameron could kiss uh, her uh, behind. Um, uh, in choice words, which we've been talking about, I thought was really interesting in that press conference. He said, now, I'm not here telling our US friends what to do, but actually, there was a line in the article which did say that. It said, uh, I'm going to drop all diplomatic niceties. I urge Congress to pass it. So it's, it's, it's interesting what's bubbled up out of all of this. The question, of course, really, that matters is, will it help and will the Republicans pass the bill? Yeah, and I think he will say that he is, he's urging them. He's, he's speaking passionately. He's, he's saying you've got to do the right thing. He's not ordering them to do it. I think the danger is that this becomes a sort of Marjorie Taylor Greene versus David Cameron story, at least for the part of two today. And I think for viewers waking up wondering what on earth is going on here, why is Marjorie, Marjorie Taylor Greene an American congresswoman telling David Cameron to kiss her ass, I think, was, was the term. I didn't know what, what, what words we could use we could at use. breakfast time. <laughs> well, I mean, if she can use it in yeah. the hallowed halls of, of uh, Capitol Hill, perhaps we can as well. I mean, if, that's, if, that, if she is saying that because she's at the, the fruitier, you might say, the harder end of Republican politics that have held out against um, sending weapons to Ukraine, they say because they want to see, first of all, the southern border dealt with, across which 10 million or so illegal migrants have, have come. Others would say that sometimes she comes pretty close, and others like her, to just parroting uh, Kremlin talking points and wonder where her sympathies and loyalties actually genuinely lie. But certainly she's pushed back against what David Cameron has said. He, she got his words slightly mangled up. I think at the beginning of the doorstep, she seemed, seemed to think the Foreign Secretary was actually comparing her to Hitler. And what he was saying was he's comparing those who are holding out on sending more money to Ukraine to those who appeased uh, the dictators in the 30s, Stalin and Hitler, and he's, um, he's urging them not to do something similar now. We're at a very sensitive point. I think, you know, uh, feelings are running very high because we're at a point where the, the war is turning against Ukraine uh, in, in Ukraine. Russia is beginning to push things against them. It is beginning to prevail. Europe has managed to stump up eventually, overcoming Hungarian opposition, billions of euros of aid, but it's still held up on Capitol Hill. The Senate has now voted to send billions of dollars of worth mm -hmm. of, of military aid and other aid to Ukraine, but the House is still holding out. And so what the David Cameron does now is crucial, and other diplomats like him. He's got to tread very carefully, but he's got to try and cajole and persuade Americans to send that money without making Joe Biden's job even harder. I actually do think he's got a better chance than most, because I think there's an elevated respect for a former prime minister. I saw that when I was there with him on Capitol Hill in December. I think also he is from the right, of course, the Conservative Party, and it's an odd small group of Republicans that need convincing. Um, so, so I think he's got a better chance than most. That doesn't mean he's going to be successful. Uh, as we were discussing earlier, Dominic, as well, it's really a, a big focus on 
one person on the speaker and whether he allows it to come to the floor because there would be enough votes for Democrats and some centrist Republicans probably to pass it uh, if that if that happened. We'll see if this bubbles over, though, uh, and, uh, as you say, continues as Marjorie Taylor Greene versus, versus David Cameron. The, the one difference is that the EU has now passed the bill. One of the issues that many Republicans had was to say, well, why haven't the EU passed the bill? That's happened now, so maybe that gives it a slight change. It, it does, but I think that sort of the, the weird place that American politics is in at the moment. As you say, it's down to one person, really, that the Speaker. But the pressure on him is from all sort of ends of the American mm -hmm. political spectrum on the, on, the, on the right end of things. And they are influenced by people who would say, well, if the Europeans are doing it, people are very suspicious of Europeans at that end of mm -hmm. American politics. And as you say, it's, it's, a, it's a very small group holding out uh, on Capitol Hill. They're, they're, they are people who, whose colleagues respect David Cameron, but I think for them, possibly, the fact that the British Foreign Secretary is trying to preach to them, um, it might be counterproductive. Yeah. Dominic, great stuff as always. Thanks so much. A Jewish charity which uh, monitors anti-Semitism across the UK says there's been an explosion in hatred with the number of incidents surging last year. Let's bring in Mari Aurora to talk uh, about this. Mari, what is this organisation and, and this report that they've been carrying out and what are the sort of rather depressing headlines? Yeah, it is depressing, Wilfred. So uh, the CST is the Community Security Trust, and they are an organisation, a charity, that monitor anti-Semitic uh, hatred, and anti-Semitic incidents here in the UK. And they also try and ensure safety and security for the Jewish community. So I'm going to just explain a few of the kind of top headline figures from this new report that came out this morning. So the report says there were more than 4,000 anti-Jewish hate incidents last year, the highest annual total the charity has ever recorded. They've been recording these figures since the 1980s. Uh, and also, of the incidents reported, the uh, CST, this is the organisation that's committed, uh, published this report, says most of them, so two-thirds, 66%, occurred on or after the 7th of October when Hamas launched that attack in Israel. And last year's incidents tally also represents about a 147% increase on the number recorded back in 2022. So it's not just a rise over decades, but it's actually really a massive uptick within the space of a year. And a lot of the data is pointing at the fact that after the October 7th attack, this is when it really started to ratchet up. Interestingly, in the report, they also talk about how, when it comes to anti-Semitic rhetoric, there's often comments, there's often references to Israel, Palestine and the Hamas attack. And they also raise the issue around the amount, the kind of percentage of these incidents that are being committed by young people, children under 18. So 18% involved offenders that were under 18. And therefore, it points to potentially a wider problem amongst children, teenagers and schools and whether there's an issue uh, with the way that schools are or not dealing dealing uh, with anti-Jewish hate. So, as you were saying, a depressing report out this morning, but unfortunately not surprising for many people who feel that actually this is their daily lives. Indeed. Uh, Mark, thanks so much uh, for that. And uh, now Gareth's back with all of the other day's top stories. Yeah, let's remind you of the other stories today. Let's start with the United States, and at least one person has been killed and 21 others injured, including children, in a mass shooting at a Super Bowl parade. Fans of the Kansas City Chiefs had been celebrating the team's victory when shots sent panic through the crowds. Three people have been arrested, but officers are yet to determine a motive. Our US correspondent Martha Kellner has more. See them pumping up the crowd there on the top of the bus. There's confetti! It was supposed to be a day of celebration. More than a million people cramming the streets of Kansas City to welcome home their Super Bowl winning team. One of its stars, Travis Kelsey, boyfriend of Taylor Swift, throwing a ball to fans. But then the party is pierced by gunshots. A mass of red shirts run in the direction of the city's Union Station. With so many people in such a small space, it's difficult to tell where the bullets are being fired from. We're in Kansas City, Missouri, and there is gunshots. One woman hiding under a car phones the police. Who's the other guy that helped me? Another parade goer tackles one of the presumed shooters. A Kansas City radio station says one of its DJs, Lisa Lopez, died in the shooting. The city's mayor was forced to run to safety too. I was there with my wife, I was there with my mother. Uh, we never would have thought that we, along with Chiefs players, along with fans, hundreds of thousands of people, would be forced to run for our safety today. 
There were 800 police patrolling the parade, but they couldn't prevent the bloodshed. Three people have now been arrested and investigators say the motive for the shooting isn't clear. It's not thought, though, to be terror related. In a statement, Travis Kelsey said, I'm heartbroken over the tragedy that took place today. My heart is with all who came out to celebrate with us and have been affected. KC, you mean the world to me. This level of gun violence is all too common. This, the 48th mass shooting just this year. At an event to mark the country's biggest sporting victory, it is a uniquely American tragedy. Martha Kellner, Sky News. Lebanese security sources say six children are among 11 people killed by Israeli strikes in villages along the country's southern border yesterday. The strikes were Israel's response to a Hezbollah rocket attack that killed one of its soldiers. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex have spent Valentine's Day in Canada, where they met athletes training for the Invictus Games, which will be held in the country next year. Prince Harry, who founded the sporting competition for war veterans, had a go at sit skiing at the resort in Whistler. Some forms of exercise are just as good as therapy and medication in treating depression and should be considered a core treatment. Australian academics, in a study published in the British Medical Journal, say the more vigorous exercise, the better, but they also say low-intensity activities like walking and yoga also had benefits. Gareth, great stuff, thank you. Now, last week we heard how global warming had exceeded temperatures of 1.5 degrees for a whole year. We know 2023 was the warmest year on record, and last month the hottest ever January was recorded globally, so it might come as no surprise that scientists are warning of a threat to animals, in particular the polar bear. And researchers are now finding that the animal's weight is dropping as they struggle to find enough food. Uh, let's uh, bring in uh, Helda Falun Stom, a polar explorer who joins us from Norway. A uh, very good morning to you. Thank you so much for, for joining us. So the, the latest uh, new headline and development as it relates to, to polar bears is not just a medium to long term one, it's a short term one that their weights are dropping. Yeah, well, uh, so uh, I'm I'm in from Svalbard, from the Norwegian Arctic, the northernmost destination in the world, where, where we have a population of uh, about 3,000 polar bears. So what we see now, I'm not a scientist, I'm a citizen scientist. I work with the smart scientists from Polar Bears International and Norwegian Polar Institute. And what we do see is that the, the polar bears, since we're having lack of uh, sea ice behind us here, this should be in frozen by now. Um, are struggling to get their main food source, which is uh, sea-dependent seals. So, uh, um, I mean, the, the starvation time is getting longer and longer, both here in the Norwegian Arctic and also in the Canadian Arctic and North America. So, um, it is uh, it's very worrying. I, it is. It's very worrying. And I have to say, because the picture took a while to load up on the screen I'm looking at, what, what an incredible, uh, incredible shot there. And I just have to pause to, to respect that. Um, but, but to continue the, the discussion, um, how long have we got uh, specifically as it relates to polar bears to, to rectify the situation? I mean, I mentioned a, a fear that they could become extinct in the script, in the lead in. I mean, is that sensationalist or is that a genuine threat in, in the next decade? Well, in the next decade, I don't know, but uh, the scientists are really worried because what we see now is that the starvation time, and they have said that maybe uh, the threshold is now 180 days where the polar bears needs to be on land and have no access to their main food source. And up in Canada, they eat berries or uh, or um, and sea eggs and, and or um, bird eggs and, and birds. And up here in Svalbard, they're trying desperately to get some reindeers during summer. So what we see is that uh, the sea ice is diminishing with uh, one till five days every decade, which means that um, up here um, for, for the last 30 years, we have lost sea ice for three months already. Uh, so meaning that the polar bears are having access to sea ice uh, much less than they are supposed to be. So um, it's hard to say anything about um, the distinction of polar bears, but they have at least uh, a, a future of being more uh, on land and trying to adapt to that, which is very 
um, unlikely in the event to um, protect the polar bear species from distinction in the future. Can humans help provide food for them or is that sort of approach uh, not a sustainable way forward for the long term? No, so uh, that is not sustainable. We have a, a wide area with polar bears and to, to give them food is, is hard. But I mean, to, uh, to try to diminish the, the impact of us humans, because this is human uh, made, is we have a lot of um, things that we should do. Um, preventing less uh, CO emission to, to the atmosphere, um, support an energy shift and uh, do renewable energies and become more uh, thoughtful users. I mean, we have all the, all the tools to, um, to mitigate the impact of climate change, and we need to do that now. Hilda, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you. Still to come here on The Breakfast Show, never before told anecdotes uh, laid bare about the king's relationship with his late mother, Queen Elizabeth. We'll speak to the author behind a new book on the royals. That's next. Welcome back. Well, after a technical glitch, a private U.S. moon lander has successfully launched from NASA's Cape Canaveral base in Florida. Uh, let's bring in our science correspondent, Thomas Moore. Thomas, uh, great to have you back again on this. So my, my, my next question in our series of questions across the three hours is, is the fact that this is from a NASA base, but it's by SpaceX, a privately owned company. So talk us through that. And uh, who is the leader now, both globally but within America, in space technology? Is it the US private sector? 
That's a really interesting question. Yes, it used to be countries that went to the moon and now it's companies. Uh, and there's been a big shift here. And it is partly because NASA really wants to find a, a cheap, reliable way of getting to the moon and back. And it can't do that itself. They move too slowly, so they need to innovate. And if you uh, give a private company a fixed price, which is well below what NASA could do it for, uh, then it's up to the company to really think about what do you need to get to the moon, rethink everything from the valves to the engines to the fuel and that's what intuitive machines are all about uh, and, and it is driving this innovation. NASA has a commercial lunar payload service program where it's, it's not only uh, intuitive ma machines but also there was last month there was a company called Astrobotic. Now they failed in their first shot at the moon but they're going back. That's the whole point. You learn from your mistakes, you put things right you go again um, Thomas we're, we're, again we're tied up very quickly so when will we get the next updates on this when, when is it scheduled to reach the moon uh, February the 22nd it's gonna be a perilous landing really exciting part of the moon that really hasn't been explored before but it's full of craters boulders and deep shadows that are gonna make it very very difficult to land but if it does land that really paves the way for everything that is to come excellent stuff Thomas great stuff uh, Thomas Moore there uh, much more to come, of course, on that story leading up to February the 22nd. Now, never before told anecdotes about the King's relationship with his late mother are revealed uh, in a new book that looks through the life and times of the royal and his path to the throne. Royal biographer and author of that book, Ingrid Seward, is with me now. Thanks so much for joining us, Ingrid. Very good morning to you. Good morning. So, uh, talk, talk us through the title of the book, My Mother and I, the inside story of the King and our late Queen, delving into an area that you think has is, is not actually been that widely covered yet, their, their personal relationship. Well, it, it, it was quite widely covered years and years ago when uh, Jonathan Dimbleby wrote an official biography of Charles. And, and at, at that time, Charles was really very anti his parents and said that he, he, you know, his mother never hugged him. He spent his whole time with nannies. But his nannies, you know, he adored his nannies. But there is a very strong bond between mother and son. And I wanted to explain that. So I just, it's a biographical trip through Charles's life, and his, uh, but it's full of anecdotes because I just think if it's not a historical, you know, hard-hitting, I think people want to read anecdotes. And so that's what I've done, you know, lots of stories about Charles and his life and Charles and his mother. So give us a couple of them, uh, maybe one from the early days when the relationship wasn't as strong and one from the later days when, you know, I think you're suggesting by the end it, it really was a very warm and strong relationship. Yes, it was. I mean, some of the anecdotes when Charles was at Gordonston I love because my late husband was in the same class, the same house, the same school as Charles. So, <laughs> we, know, so we know the source of some of the stories. Oh, yeah, I've tried <laughs> to source all of them, actually. Because I, get, I hate reading a royal source said. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, what the boys did, because you know how wicked boys are, they decided Charles snored very badly because he had sinusitis. And his bed was right by the window. And the boys in the room, they went to the room above with an old fashioned tape recorder and they put, they just dangled down the microphone from the, their window to his window and recorded him snoring. Royal snoring on Royal the snoring, the future king well, I snoring. I don't know if that would be uh, hugely valuable or not. It sounds incredibly dull. But I guess with, with, with whose uh, who's voice it is, nose it is, I don't know, uh, it would have value. G give us one of the, the more modern day or recent ones of, of the sort of warmth between uh, the king and uh, his late mother. Well, I think that uh, during the Diana period, they, they were really at loggerheads. But... I think that, that really the Queen always really admired what her son was doing, especially with the Prince's Trust. Mm -hmm. And that's when they became very close and she was really proud of him. And then she started to speak publicly about her, you know, her praise for him. And he called her his darling mum. His darling mother, actually, not mum. Yeah. <laughs> Mummy, mama. Um, and um, I just think that the, the closeness... But at one time, the Queen despaired, and she said to her, her mother, the late, you know, the late Queen Mother, she mm. said, you know, three of the four of my children are divorced. You know, where have I gone wrong, Mummy? Where have I gone wrong? And the Queen Mother said, oh, it's another generation. Don't worry about it. Well, and of course, uh, famously, towards the, the end of her life, Queen Elizabeth uh, made clear that she wanted Camilla to be referred to as Queen. Um, what do you make of his cancer diagnosis, Ingrid? And 
What, what can we draw from, from your book about his resilience and, uh, and I guess his positivity as well? Because both of those things are going to be needed in, in, uh, in spades in the weeks and months ahead. Well, when Charles was a little boy, because his mother had, well, when he was four years old, his mother had just become queen, um, any illness, she, the, the children were removed from, from her. So he, you know, just when a kid needs its mum, they're taken away because, you know, the Queen mm -hmm. couldn't get an infection. And um, so I think it's made him very stoic about illness. And he refuses to give in to colds. If the royals have a cold, they, you know, they don't go near each other because they don't want to cancel engagement. Mm. So I think he's very stoic and I think that also he's a very private person. So coming out and talking about his illness is probably not the easiest thing mm -hmm. for Charles, but I think it's, it's, he was really pleased with the positive reaction he had to, you know, to his prostate. Mm -hmm. And I think that eventually, you know, when he's hopefully better, that he will talk about this operation or whatever he's doing or his treatment. He will come out and talk about it. And I like that because it's the way forward for the monarchy to be more open. Ingrid, thanks so much for stopping by this morning. And uh, Ingrid's uh, new book, uh, My Mother and I, The Inside Story of the King and Our Late, late Queen, is out already? or it's about out today. Out today. There we go. Should have guessed that. Our booking team always times things uh, spot on. Ingrid, thank you. So to come on The Breakfast Show, uh, we'll be speaking to our crime correspondent, Martin Brunt, as the lead suspect in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann faces trial over a separate set of sexual abuse allegations. We'll be right back. I'm Greg Milam, and I'm Sky's chief North of England correspondent. There is now a mandatory evacuation for this street. For many people, Harvey is far from over. Christchurch has been changed forever by what happened here. There was a river of blood coming out of the mosque. We are standing on the supply line right into the heart of America's opioid crisis. I've reported from around the world and around the UK. Are you trying to run me over, Sir Philip? No, go away. Look like it, sir. Joe Biden knows the celebrations are over and this is a country in crisis. It is almost impossible to predict where these fires will go next. Ida has certainly left its mark on New Orleans. It just feels heartbreaking. Do you regret the tweet, Gary? There's no sign, publicly at least, of either side being willing to give ground. How do you reassure the public that all of these mistakes wouldn't be made again? I'm Helen Ann Smith, I'm Sky's Asia correspondent, and I'm based here in Beijing. Slightly more, slightly better. Fly Emirates, fly better.
Welcome back. Well, a suspect in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann is due to appear in a German court tomorrow to face trial over allegations of rape and sexual abuse of children. They relate to separate incidents which are said to have taken place in Portugal between 2000 and 2017. 45-year-old Christian B, who we cannot fully name or show due to German privacy laws, hasn't been charged in the McCann case and has denied any involvement. Let's bring in uh, our crime correspondent, Martin Brunt. So, Martin, this case starts tomorrow. Uh, ju just talk us through what we do and don't know about uh, this, this individual and, uh, and the, the, the crimes that he's on trial for, how and where they were located. Well, we know an awful lot about him. Um, you know, all of us who've covered the Madeleine McCann case have been picking over the life of Christian B for the last four years since it emerged that he was the new and the prime suspect for Madeleine's abduction. Um, but tomorrow, when the trial starts, uh, this is going to be about lots of things completely unconnected. Um, with uh, with the Madeleine McCann case. I mean, we know, for instance, about him um, individually, uh, that uh, he had a rather troubled upbringing. Um, he, uh, he was fostered out by his parents. Um, he got into trouble as a teenager um, for various minor crimes and then kind of drifted into this life where he flitted between Germany and Portugal and um, started getting involved in drugs. Um, he was um, convicted of fuel theft. And then, of course, um, there were more serious crimes where he was convicted of um, what some people might consider more minor sex offences against um, young children. Um, but, of course, currently he's in prison in Germany serving a seven-year sentence for the rape of a, an American woman, an elderly American woman, in Portugal. Now, when the trial starts tomorrow, he faces five charges um, that all stem from allegations in Portugal, and they're spread over 17 years, you know, very much during that time when he was travelling between the two countries. But he's facing three rape charges and two sexual um, crimes against young children. Uh, again, nothing to do with the Madeleine McCann case. And we should remind viewers that uh, he has denied any involvement in Madeleine McCann. And he also, uh, tomorrow, will deny anything to do with those five other charges he's facing. And, and just uh, why has he never faced uh, specific charges relating to Madeleine McCann? You say he became prime suspect a number of years ago. Um, is that now been fully investigated and rejected and he's facing only these separate cases or, or is there a reason to delay further investigations into other cases until this trial uh, has run its course? He is still the suspect um, for the abduction of Madeleine McCann and um, it's a good question, why hasn't he been charged? We know because the German prosecutor who's in charge of the case, uh, we know that or what he tells us is that he has a lot of circumstantial evidence uh, against Christian B. But what he doesn't have, or he certainly didn't have the last time I spoke to the prosecutor, he didn't have any forensic evidence. Um, now, the German authorities have had him as their main suspect for the past, what, four years? Um, but certainly they've known about him and the possibility that he might have been involved in Madeleine's abduction, uh, abduction um, going back, well, more years than that. And, I mean, one of the um, interesting facts is that uh, in 2013, his name was put up as a potential suspect, and he was called in for an interview with German police, uh, and he did that, uh, and they let him go. And, um, you know, they weren't concerned that he might have been involved at that stage. But it was only in 2020... Um, when uh, when they started looking at him more seriously uh, as, a, as a suspect for Madeleine. Martin, great stuff. Thanks so much for that. And uh, no doubt we'll be hearing much more from Martin on this case in Germany in the coming weeks and months as it gets started tomorrow. Quick look at the weather now. Warm memories wherever you go. To fly, to fly. The Weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways.
It will be mostly very mild into the weekend, but rather unsettled. It's generally mild, but quite murky now, with hill fog and drizzly outbreaks uh, for many, uh, and heavier, more general rain over northern Britain and around the Irish Sea. That's your weather. The weather, sponsored by Qatar Airways. Now, do you know what uh, any of these emojis either side of us mean? Apparently, how we interpret the images differs between men and women, between people of different ages, partly because it can be ambiguous to pick out the different pictures uh, and partly uh, because uh, people just read them differently. Apparently, women are more able to accurately deduce what emojis mean. So, actually, I guess we should be asking you on this, Mark. <laughs> but last hour, I revealed what the my most used emoji is. What do you reckon yours is? Mine's either the love heart or the rolling of the eyes. Eye rolling is a classic, mm -hmm, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And how often do we think that in our daily lives? But you can't, you can't actually depict it as well as the emoji does. Yeah. No, no. The emoji's Good better. Good demonstration there, well done. <laughs> um, what about yours? What's your most used? Uh, just laughing, crying emoji, I think. Yeah. Just because it's easy, isn't it? And it so the other one, I was mentioning that one of the hand-related ones I use a lot. The, the other one which I use a lot, I'm also not quite sure what it means. Okay. So it's, it's this one, and I never know if that is two people high-fiving, or is it a prayer? It's a thank you prayer, isn't it? It's a thank, it? you, it's a thank you prayer. prayer. But is it, is it not also two people saying high-five? This, this is a bigger, no. bigger question about how you operate in daily life, if you high-five five Well, I like don't, this. I don't, but it could be a side view of two people high-fiving. You're overthinking it, Will. Yeah, well, but, but, it, but it is interesting because it shows it almost polar opposite meanings. I'm also very concerned about this shot when it goes back to <laughs> camera 26 and I just have a man drooling over my shoulder. <laughs> which is... Also, you have a man yawning, which is... OK, a rude, telling. absolutely. Yeah. Well, <laughs> 10 seconds until we've got to stop talking. 10 seconds until we've got to stop. Uh, guys, as always, it's uh, been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And Kamali Melbourne's got you covered next. Don't go anywhere.